Good evening. I would like to call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, June 14th, 2016. We will all rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to, to the flag to be led by Aislinn Bratt. We will remain standing for a moment of silent meditation in memory of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our first item for this evening is our agenda. Uh, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda, Dr. Dance? There are none. Mr. Here, Chairman? Yes, Ms. Miller? I have an addition. Yes. Um, I would like to add an agenda item, amendment to Rule 6202, Form A. Okay. Um, Ms. Miller, that uh, item was referred to uh, PRC at our previous meeting. And uh, it would not be proper to uh, conflict with that, uh, that recommendation to move to PRC. So I would say that that would be out of order at this time. It, by my understanding, it was not actually referred to PRC. There was some discussion about it. But really, I was not uh, able to make my motion or have discussion on that item last time. Um, uh, and, I, and I don't, and so I think you're, You've, you're acting unilaterally in that. I, I know you, you had said that the um, board leadership had discussed that in setting the agenda for this meeting. Um, I think that's a, a unilateral action. I, I think the proper order of procedure would be that the board would be able to discuss the item and, and um, take a vote, and then it could be referred elsewhere. Well, yeah, it's, it's not my intent to make a unilateral decision, but it was my understanding that we did refer the issue as a board to PRC, and in that regard, that's why I'm saying it's, it's out of order, not that we just decided. Right, um, but there was no vote taken to do that. Well, there was a directive to do that. I don't, so. I don't, well, a directive would be a vote in the form of a vote. Well, and that didn't occur, but, yeah. so I would like to be able to have the discussion on that item today. Well, my recollection, I don't know if I just walked in, I apologize, is that Mr. Collins was the one who recommended that um, it was referred to the PRC. Is that correct? Do you remember that, Mr. Collins? I'm late. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> Yeah. The motion that I attempted to make at the last meeting regarding uh, yeah. Form 62. Miss, I don't know what yeah, Miss Miller, I, I'm, I'm going to decide. I, excuse me. No, I, I'm going to decide right now that the motion is out of order. If that we find later, we're just going to move on with the meeting based on my ruling that the motion is out of order because we referred the item to PRC previously. Well, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. May I speak as chair of PRC? Yes. PRC has not had a meeting since that referral. That's what I just exactly. said. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on with the agenda. Um, our next item is selection of speakers. Uh, Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting. For anyone wishing to speak at this meeting, this eve oh, do we, do we confirm our agenda then? Yes. Yeah, we have to, I'm sorry. We need to, uh, I'm going to go back, I'm sorry. Um, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. One opposed. The motion carries. Thank you. Um, now our next item is a selection of speakers. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled meeting to 10. Each speaker is allotted three minutes to discuss his or her issue. This completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right. The first 10 uh, from the box will be our speakers for tonight during public comment portion of the meeting. If fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who sign up will be permitted to speak. Thank you. And the first speaker is Tim Gordon. Number two is Billy Berman. 
Number three, Demetra Howard. Number four, Gail Beltland. Beltand. Oops, sorry about that. What's this, five? Five, Mary Soltis. Six, Hazel Jones. Seven, Glenn Gelcher. Gelchar. Eight is blank. Okay. Eight. Eight is Katrina Swales. Nine is Lisa Donahoe. And ten is Julie Romeo. Thank you very much. We'll hear from our speakers uh, later in the evening. At this time, we have a great pleasure of a uh, special order of business tonight where we will recognize our student board member. So at this time, I'll call on Ms. Walia and Mr. Gillis and Dr. Dance to uh, go up front so we can uh, our recognition. You want me to move the mic? Mike. Mike. <laughs> are they doing a resolution or are they? They're doing a resolution. Or are they just kind of giving a resolution? Yeah. I've been reminded, but thank you for reminding me again. This is one of our real pleasures where we get to recognize one of our great members, student members at this time. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to ask Ms. Walia to introduce any family members or friends she might have here with her tonight. Okay, I have my uncle, um, my cousin, is okay. my dad here somewhere? He's not here, okay. <laughs> okay, and then uh, I have my teacher, Mr. G, who's somewhere over there, and then I have Miss Murray and Nick, who, and Danielle, actually, and yeah, Danielle. Yeah, Maduka, our uh, student board member from last year. So, um, uh, what we uh, want to do tonight is certainly recognize the great contributions of Ms. Walia, and we have a resolution to present. Mr. Chairman, I interrupt for a brief moment to move the adoption of the resolution. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Second. All right. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Thank you, Mr. Birch. <laughs> All right. Whereas, Diksha Walia has served as a student board member of the Board of Education of Baltimore County with honor and distinction for the 2015-2016 school year, including participation on the board's curriculum committee. And her role as a student leader begins at Kenwood High School, where she has served as president of Kenwood Student Government Association, and her leadership extends countywide through her work on the board and her membership on the Superintendent Student Advisory Council and the Baltimore County Student Council's Executive Board. And whereas Deeksha's leadership activities are evident as she played a key role in the organization of the BCS Countywide Anti-Bullying Week, and she also volunteers extensively in her community. And her outstanding academic performance has been affirmed in many ways, from being an international baccalaureate student with a grade point average of 4.0, and along with being a member of the National Honor Society, Math Honor Society, Science Honor Society, Social Studies Honor Society, <laughs> and the Spanish Honor Society. And whereas Deeksha is to be commended on her efforts in working with the Baltimore County Student Council on expanding the involvement of students in the selection of the student member of the board and will continue to bring honor to this school district as she continues her education at the University of Maryland Honors College at College Park. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education of Baltimore County assembled in regular session on the 14th day of June in the year 2016 expresses to Deeksha its fondest regards and gratitude for her services and be it further resolved that the board does her herewith extend its best wishes for happiness, good health, and continued success in future endeavors, and that it directs a copy of this resolution to be recorded among the permanent records of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. And this is signed by Charles McDaniels, your truly chair, and S. Dallas Dance, the <laughs> secretary treasurer. Congratulations. <laughs>
certainly did a great job. And there's more. We have a certificate of appreciation and recognition of your service as the 2015-2016 student member of Baltimore County. You are awarded a scholarship in the amount of $100 for your service to Baltimore <laughs> County. <laughs> So I get give this to you in case you uh, want to have. I'm going to say work. everything during my report at one time. Okay. <laughs> so again, we congratulate Deetcha, and uh, we're going to take a little picture here. All right, uh, we'll move into our next uh, agenda item, which is the superintendent's report, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Dance. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Uh, first of all, before I get started, I want to say a special thank you to this board. Um, I did not make comments uh, during the past two board meetings when the board was deliberating um, the superintendent's contract, but um, I wanted to express gratitude to the board for its reappointment um, of me as your superintendent for another four years. Um, I will tell you, I'm extremely excited um, about the next four years, and yes, I intend to work the entire four years um, <laughs> of that contract. Um, because I think we are doing some good things as a school system. We have a long way to go, but we've done some really good work over the last four years. And um, I will tell this board I'm committed to you, I'm committed to the school system, um, but we do work better together than we do as individuals. Um, but also to our entire team, thank you for what you do day in and day out for our students. Um, I want to say a special thank you also to the members of our county council led by our chairwoman Vicki Allman. Um, the county council has approved the county's budget for FY17 which funded the school system well on the operating but also on the capital side. A special thank you also goes to the county executive and his administrative team. Um, we will now be able to accelerate all air conditioning projects that were not included in the fiscal 17 budget. And so I know that this has been a hot topic for all of us over the course of the year. Um, I think one of our board members said it well when I think we all should declare victory and move on. I know that as I've talked with Kevin um, Smith, I've talked with Pete Dixit, we're all looking forward to dedicating someone to this work to make sure that we're committing ourselves to our school communities and we deliver on time, under budget. Um, so we're really um, excited um, about, about that work. Um, in addition, I released today um, the timeline um, for all remaining air conditioning projects. So the 34 schools that do not have air conditioning right now that will open the 2017 school year, 2016-17 uh, school year, I should say, there's a timeline in place now that will say when the design is happening, when we expect to bring it to the board for vote, and when we expect substantial classrooms to have air conditioning. So that's open to our public. We will be posting that online um, as well. Um, two very... Um, 
important people who've made a big, big impression on me over the course of the year. We just recognized one mm -hmm. with Deke Shawalia, and it's funny, Debbie just looked at me and said another one is graduating and going on to college. I recognize now that being here four years, uh, we have our first student board member who actually graduated um, from college, and that's Logan McNanny. So we have students who've done some really good work um, going through, and Logan said on my interview when I was interviewed for superintendent, uh, we've done some really good work with our student board members, and they continue to make us proud. One thing that was not mentioned in the resolution, uh, because I don't think it was determined at the time the resolution was written, Deke Shawalia it was the valedictorian of the class of 2016 oh, wow. for Kenwood High School. Oh, yeah. The other one is Nick Burton Pradley, and I tell Nick he looks more presidential every time that I see him. Um, I am guaranteeing Nick's going to run for office one day, and probably for president, um, and he definitely has the leadership skills in order to be able to do that. But we wish Nick extreme well wishes as he goes off to the College of Women Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia, and Deeksha, she goes off to College Park. Um, but two very bright, shining stars from Baltimore County. Um, in front of the board tonight are uh, two calendar options, and I wanted to just take an opportunity to explain that to our public um, as the board deliberates both options. Um, we were informed by MSDE based on the testing calendar for the 16-17 school year that they are recognizing the Eid on uh, one of the Eid holidays on September the 12th as opposed to September the 11th. Um, the board, through its policy review uh, committee and some of its recommendations to us, asked us to wherever possible we make that a professional development day for teachers. And honoring that request, I am bringing forward a recommendation because MSDE has changed that September the 12th be a professional development day for our teachers for next school year. That is option one. I do also know that the Policy Review Committee has been um, investigating and reviewing some options in terms of additional policies they may want to create, uh, one particularly around heat. Um, and there, there's an option two, as MSDE has informed us, that if we are looking to adjust our calendar to um, make up any time we may lose for any type of inclement weather, and it's just not snow or ice, but it could be for heat, that those days need to be made up during the school year. Um, and so there's an option two that actually calls for us to have a calendar adjustment to make those days up throughout the school year um, as opposed to tacking those days on at the beginning or at the end of the year. And that's for the board's uh, consideration uh, this evening. I also want to um, just say in two very uh, quick things. Um, one, I just had an opportunity over the last uh, 14 days to shake the hands of over 7,200 students as we graduated the class of 2016. And many board members uh, were there with me, hanging in there as I challenged them to say something different to every single graduate as he or she walked across the stage. Um, and many of them stuck with me um, and did it. But we had a lot of fun. And it puts the year in perspective. It puts the work in perspective. When you see um, the smiles on some of our faces, uh, the faces of our kids, you ask them what they're doing next year, and many of them have benefited because of dual enrollment options that this board has voted on through its budget. They've benefited through other options as a school system that we provided, whether it's magnet or comprehensive programs. So I wish the class of 2016 um, well wishes, Godspeed to you as you go on to the next journey of your life. If you go to our website, bcps.org, one of the pieces of um, feedback we got from our communities is that it wanted videos of graduations to be live streamed. And we've archived those videos. So if you go to our main website, you'll be able to stroll through any high school graduation and see it. Um, and so that was one thing that the Department of Communications, in fact, did for us. Um, last but not least, I want to say a special uh, thank you uh, to our team. And this is to our students, because you empower us. It's to our support personnel who make sure the trains are really going um, at the right time. And it's really to our principals and our teachers though in our schools. And I have been inspired. I was in a school just yesterday um, as I crashed one of the mentoring sessions that we had for young people. And our teachers rock. Um, but they deserve a break, though. Um, and so over the summer, uh, before you go on break, I want to say a special thank you for your work, for your leadership with all of our kids. Um, but I know, though, you're thinking about curriculum writing and PD opportunities this summer. Don't hesitate to take the time for your family and your friends and to rejuvenate, uh, because we definitely want to make sure that you have rested very well as we welcome over 112,000 students back to our school systems next year. But from my heart to yours, a special thank you to all of our employees for the work that you do. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Um, our next agenda item is uh, Chair's report, and I uh, just have some brief comments this evening to say that the close of the school year is a great time for reflection. The series of high school graduations that recently concluded was extremely uplifting to all that participated. The teachers and administrators of 
at BCPS high schools, as well as those throughout the system, must be recognized for their exemplary job that they're doing in educating our students and pre preparing our, these young men and women for opportunities and challenges in the 21st century. I would like to compliment the executive staff, assistant superintendents, as well as many of my fellow board members who are always well represented at the 24 graduation ceremonies. I believe that Dr. Dance deserves special recognition for his participation in each one of the high school graduations. It's an excellent example of the energy and commitment that he brings to uplifting and educating the students of BCPS. While it is appropriate to celebrate and recognize the successes of the 2015-2016 school year, and there are many, I want all to be assured that our board recognizes that there are opportunities and a need to improve the education process in Baltimore County. There are challenges with an aging infrastructure, growing student population, English language learners, assuring wise use of financial resources, just to mention a few. Our Board of Education has experienced, has experienced an unprecedented transition in its composition during the past school year. We went through the forming, storming, and norming process of new group formation with perhaps an extended storming period. We do have a board retreat schedule for next month where we will continue to work toward becoming more effective and efficient in working together. Each of one of us is a volunteer committed to improving education for our students, and the board collectively re recognizes our need to improve in order to provide be better educational opportunities for our students across the BCPS region. Lastly, I would like to extend my personal best wishes to our departing student board member. Diksha truly has provided unique leadership in her time with the board. Her engaging and outgoing personality has really allowed for a greater understanding of the board by the students of BCPS. I'm confident that she will be successful in the next phase of her education, and I will really miss her and her valuable input to the board. All the best to you. This concludes my comments for the evening. And I'll turn it over to Deeksha at this time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I want to thank everyone um, for the recognition. I'm not worthy, but I'm very grateful. This year has flown by. Um, with that being said, last June, I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, Danielle prepared me to the best of her ability, so thank you, Danielle, wherever you are. But um, yeah, no, no, I did not know what I was getting myself into, but no matter what, it was worth every moment. So honored and privileged to have the opportunity to represent 111,000 students of Baltimore County. This position is very rewarding, seeing how I'm directly making an impact on the education of students. So I want to thank the students of the county for allowing me this opportunity to represent them. I also want to update the students on the progress that I've made towards achieving the goals I set in the beginning of this year. This year, communication was my main focus. I started the year with a meeting with Michael Dickerson and his staff to create a yearly plan. We all then worked together to help me become more visible to students and allow students to easily contact me. We created a small web page on the BCPS website and I became the co-host of BCPS TV show Chat Cafe, where I talked, uh, sat down and talked to students about issues pertinent to us. I also had videos that updated students, and Dr. Dance allowed me to co-host student town halls with him. This year, I believe we've, we've been very successful in our goal of promoting the SMOP position and communicating with students, especially through social media. I also visited schools to talk to students and brought feedback about STAT back to staff. In order to give students more say in who, and in order to give students more say in who the next SMOP will be, I, along with Baltimore County Student Councils, chained the SMOB election process and hosted our first annual SMOB election forum. Lastly, I had the privilege of working with Mr. Smith and Ms. Levenstein for helping improve our school lunches for our students. Speaking about our next SMOB, I would like to congratulate Aislinn for being selected by the students to be her next SMOB. Aislinn, can you please stand? I know you'll be a great student member, and I wish you the best of luck and look forward to seeing and hearing about all the things that you do, the great things you will do next year. And I'll only be a text message or phone call away if you ever need me. On a more personal note, I cannot go without thanking some people who I know I could not have gotten through this year without. First of all, I would like to thank my fellow board members who became a family and helped me along the way and let me serve alongside of them. Debbie, for keeping me in line and organizing everything. <laughs> Without your candle ca calendar invites, I would not have been able to survive. You've been a board mom, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Dance, for being an awesome guide and support all year. You've always been there to support me and help me in any way you could, so thank you for everything you've done for me this year. You've taught me so much, and I cannot thank you enough. 
Also, we've had a lot of fun moments, most of them being you giving me a hard time, but I'll still cherish them, <laughs> so thank you. Um, my school staff and teachers, one of who's here today to thank me, and without your support, I would not have been able to ba balance school and this position. And like Dr. Sanson said, I apparently did not go to school this year, so I needed all the help I could get. <laughs> so, uh, Michael, thank you so much for everything. Um, sh I sh randomly showed up in your offices with crazy ideas. However, you've always been so supportive and helpful in making my crazy ideas come become reality. Thank you for bearing with Nick and I, because I know that was a job all on its own. <laughs> so thank you for everything you've done for me personally. Ms. Murray, I don't even know what to say about you. One, th one thing is the fact that I could not have done it without you. You're the best ad advisor anyone could ask for. I've not seen someone as dedicated and supportive of student leadership as you are. I've lost count on how many times I've texted or called you because I needed someone to talk to or I needed some advice. I've shown up randomly in your office at least twice a week and you've been a backbone through all of it. Nick could not have asked for a better partner in crime. You've been the right hand of everything. Everything we've done, we've done together. Ms. Murray's said it often that we've been attached at the hip all year. Uh, would not have been a decent student leader without you. Thank you for dealing with me, and I'm fortunate to have gained you as a really good friend through all of this. Communication Department and BCPS TV, thank you. You've spent so much time with me this year and dealt with all of mine and Nick's craziness, but all of you all of you have been so supportive and helpful. And thank you, BCPS and BCPS staff, for this awesome year and for the past 13 years of Baltimore County. I will forever be grateful and cherish all the relationships and experiences I've gained here in Baltimore County. I apologize for the long report, but that concludes the report for me. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walia. Um, our next agenda item is our public comment. Uh, this is one of the opportunities we pro provide to hear views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens and will take your comments into consideration, even though it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues which are raised. When appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and school system, this is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to, the pub to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. I would like to remind the public the inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to observe the timer behind me, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that time expired. Now we have a new timing system here starting tonight, and I just want you to observe it. I think a buzzer will work and everything. And the new feature is that the microphones also cut off after three minutes. <laughs> so. Uh, You'll have to, again, in respect to all of our speakers, we're going to ask that you uh, keep your uh, comments and remarks to three minutes. So with that, um, we'll begin with our advisory and stakeholder groups. And our first speaker is from TABCO, Ms. Abby Baton. Good evening. Good evening, Ms. Chair McDaniels, Vice Chairman Gillis with two S's, <laughs> Dr. Dance, and members of the board. First, just a word about our student board members. I have been always, from the very beginning, impressed way back for every year, and each year they seem to be getting better and better. So, Deeksha, you have done the students really proud, and Baltimore County as well. Thank so, thank you. So with a few short days of school left and summer vacation looming large, it is always a time to reflect. Unfortunately, the current events that just happened make that a little difficult. So faced with another horrific mass shooting, the people who perpetrate these vicious attacks are deviants who are quick to blame society while often targeting groups to hate. We have faced these events time and time again Instead of wringing our hands and finger pointing at everyone else, it is time we stood up and worked toward real solutions. You may be asking, how does all of this reflect back on schools? I know I have brought to this board our issues with discipline. 
I have also talked about age-appropriate education and how we teach children to be whole children able to work well with others. This is not just so our schools have better discipline. The reason for these skills to be taught early on has to do with life skills so people won't commit these types of atrocities. We see all kinds of bad behavior because kids don't learn early on how to work together, share, and deal with disappointments. Think of the road rage out there. It probably has happened to all of us in one form or another. I know I have been cut off purposely by someone who thought I had done something wrong to him on the highway. Luckily, I was getting off the road and he couldn't follow me. We must begin to really hold our students accountable for these behaviors. We must provide the opportunity for them to learn how to work with others and to teach them strategies so they know how to rein in their anger and use it in a positive way. I, for one, am not willing to live in a world where we are afraid of others and wall ourselves inside and fortress our homes. We live in the United States of America. Today is Flag Day. To honor our flag and our country, it is time we work together to solve these problems. Starting with our own students is a great place to begin. There is a famous song from the show South Pacific, and the first line is, you have to be carefully taught to hate. We must reverse that and teach love, respect for all, and strategies to work within that frame of mind. I do wish everyone a wonderful summer and hope everyone gets time to take um, a time to rest for themselves, to rest, relax, and renew so that we can start over in the fall and really do this job. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Bate. Our next speaker for the evening is P.J. Schaefer from the uh, Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee. Good evening. Good evening, Dr. Dance, members of the board, Chairman McDaniels. Um, this is the first time I will be speaking to you as a past member of the CCAC. Um, we've had recently had an election, and um, I'd like to introduce you at least to the names of the new CCAC leadership uh, committee. Uh, Megan Stuart Sickering and Hope Messinger are the two no new co-chairs of the CCAC committee. Hope's in the room. Will she stand up and be recognized? <laughs> Uh, the, the new co-vice chairs are Pam Guest and Eleanor Crowell. Um, I'm excited because it's a, it's a new, eager team um, approach. And uh, don't be exci it's that excited that you're getting rid of me. Apparently, they've okay. recruited the past executive team to stay on and help out and mentor for a while. So you'll still be seeing my face. Um, the only other reason that I'm here this evening, so I'll keep it short, is there are, I believe, five contracts up this evening that affects special ed. Um, number four on the agenda for psychological services, number 17 on the agenda dealing with licensed therapists, number 22 on the agenda dealing with resources for students with cognitive disabilities, number 26 dealing with temporary adult assistance and therapeutic behavioral aids, um, and number 28 um, regarding remedial services for tutoring. CCAC has reviewed the, um, them and how they affect special ed and endorses the all four, all excuse me, all five of those contracts. Um, and just wanted to put that plug in there in that spot as well. Um, and with that, I will bid you all happy summer. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Our next speaker for the evening is from the Citizens Advisory Committee for Gifted and Talented Education, Julie Miller Breitz. Good evening, President McDaniels, board members, Dr. Dance, and the BCPS community. Good evening. At the beginning of the school year, a core group of GTCAC members got together and worked on our list of our priorities. In reviewing it earlier today, I found that we made real progress in some areas and will clearly have to continue our work in other areas. As the current school year comes to a close, our group now has a much firmer grasp of the philosophy behind the new approach to gifted and talented education. We also know that much confusion on this point remains and we are working on ways to educate parents about how gifted and talented works within BCPS. We have engaged in regular communication with BCPS stakeholders via our website, Facebook account, and mass mailings, and have also been very thankful to see notices of our meetings being regularly broadcasted through BCPS communication channels. Over the summer, a group of us will be working collaboratively with the Advanced Academic Office on revamping the parent handbook. 
We have worked over the last two years on revisions to policy 6401 and remain invested in following it through the adoption. We have been excited to hear that the new 6401 policy will contain language around data and accountability for the growth of GT. But we will continue to voice our concerns about dropping the term gifted and talented. We are thrilled about the progress being made in piloting a cognitive assessment in some schools next year to hopefully increase the rate of GT identification for students who are typically underserved. We are also very happy to hear about proposals moving forward in regards to students who access home and hospital services in order to ensure these students receive appropriate support for GT and AP level classes. We were encouraged to read the editorial piece in the Baltimore Sun about a possible regional magnet school for GT students as meeting the needs of super high achievers is something parents routinely tell us is a problem area across all age groups. From pre-K and up, it is clear that something must be done for those children who are significantly performing above their peer group. We are engaged in robust conversations about the STAT initiative and how it is impacting GT learners and will continue to watch it carefully. Similarly, we will work on continuing the conversation around GT and AP classes. As we did in our Finding the Right Path meeting in November, we will help educate parents about their options in transition years and monitor how those options are communicated to parents and students. We are finding that 2E students are an area of great concern and are happy to hear that the AA office has been researching exemplars for possible use in Baltimore County. We have also reached out to surrounding counties in an effort to better understand how we can best support BCPS parents in this regard. We will never stop advocating for increased professional development for faculty and staff regarding the cognitive, social, and emotional needs of GT students, 2E or otherwise. We have been successful this year with increased membership in our group and are hoping to keep that growth up. We are regularly seeing new faces at our meetings, which we love, so please know that you are all cordially invited to any and all of our meetings. We have also reached out to other advisory groups and have learned some advocacy tips and tricks from them. Finally, we have had multiple parents ask about how they can become GT liaisons in their school's PTA, so we are excited about working on how that might be best accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> we Thank you very much. <laughs> Our next speaker is uh, Tim Gordon. Greetings to the board and thank you for having me. Good evening. My name is Tim Gordon. I'm the math department chairman at Franklin Middle School. Um, quite frankly, our school has taken some heat in the press lately, and I'm here to talk about some of the good initiatives that we've been doing, particularly in our math department. One of our new initiatives this past school year has been the implementation of all male eighth grade math courses. Students for these classes were hand selected as they have struggled with math throughout their careers. One particular class was specifically all black males math students who failed at least one quarter of math last year. Both of these classes had many successes. First, the MAP data showed 60% and 67% of students in these classes met their growth report. This was well above the school target of 50%. Second, 13 of the 18 black males went the entire year without failing a quarter, and two of them became straight A math students. In our other male, all male math class, 21 out of the 22 students passed math for the year, and 17 of the 22 received a C or higher for the year. As we continue to work on closing the achievement gap, we're starting a new initiative for next school year where we will mentor minorities in the advanced academics program. We, is also, we have also taken pride in being pioneers in many of the current initiatives by Baltimore County. For the past three years, we have ran Algebra and boot camps over the summer. We have consistently gotten 60 plus students a year in our building to strengthen the many prerequisite skills for the rigorous Algebra One program. Essentially, Baltimore County is now using the same model with their extended year instruction. We were three years ahead of this instructional shift. We also got ahead of the curve in t terms of increasing time and a half mass accelerated, <coughs> excuse me, mass seven accelerated courses. This year we had more students in time and a half accelerated math than not. We firmly believe a curriculum that is a year and a half of content needs a year and a half of math instruction to teach it. Likewise, as we continue to adapt areas of need, all eighth grade algebra one will be time and a half courses next year. This will give the kids the adequate time to work with a truly demanding curriculum and properly prepare them for the park assessment. 
As Algebra 1 in the eighth grade is an emphasis for the Office of Mathematics, we are continually changing the way we deliver instruction to meet those demands. This past school year, we have also seen major growth in our Ascend Math program. In seventh grade, 21 students took Ascend Math, <clears throat> 10 completed two plus years of growth, and 10 completed one plus years of growth. Many of these students were starting at a second grade level. In our eighth grade Ascend Math classes, 22 of the 24 students showed a year or more growth with multiple students showing three or four or more years of growth. In fact, our eighth grade math teacher, Ms. Matheny, has been asked to be the lead teacher of the summer for six schools around the county. As a math department, we continue to adjust, adapt, and evolve with the changing needs of our school population and the demands of the career and college standards. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Billy Berman. Good evening. Before I begin, I'm, I'd like to just introduce uh, the parents from Franklin Middle who have come here to support. My name is Billy Berman. My daughter Brianna is finishing up her first year at Franklin Middle. I'm a past executive board member and chairman of the Buildings and Grounds Committee for the Gemacy School. Over the past prior three years, when Brianna was still in Franklin Elementary, my wife and I would hear things about Franklin Middle. Normally, I would sit back and wait to let things work themselves out, but not this time. Not when I hear weekly about what goes on in school. Not when I fear my daughter or a child whom I coached might be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Not when I find out about a situation that occurred at the school from ABC News and not from the administration. Not when I receive email after email from parents who tell me that their kids have been beaten up or bullied at the school. Not when I find out that all the restrooms are locked in the hallways. Not when I receive anonymous calls from both past and present teachers who inform me how low the morale is at the school. You see, somehow or another, I have become the head of an advocate group, a parent group, consisting of incoming and existing parents. Over the last three weeks, this group has grown in size from 20 parents to 170 parents. Over the last three weeks, I've reached out to anyone in the administration and school board who would be willing to listen to our plea. Unfortunately, the principal doesn't think that there's a problem at the school. I've called and spoken to Dr. Penelope Knox. I suggested that she meet our group, but refused to do so. She did, however, offer her email and phone number. The only people willing to meet us was Richard Muth, and Marisol Johnson, and for that, we are grateful. I can see for myself challenges the school faces. I've experienced how no one in the, in the administration or the school board has really been willing to talk about the problems. I can see for myself kids roaming the hallway during class. I see kids who have been sent to the office for bad behavior, sitting in chairs in the office, playing on their phone and disturbing school staff. I hear from my daughter who tells me that one of her teachers was out sick, and it took not one, not two, but three teachers to control the class. Up until now, the administration, school board, and school security would like us to believe it's our perception. One of the mottos I see from the school board is creating a culture of deliberate excellence. That culture is not being effectively created at Franklin. They like to say it's open and transparent. If you're open and transparent, Parents deserve the right to see what the surveys said about the teachers, about the administration that TABCO provided. We cannot and we will not stand by. We've discussed many topics, but we need to admit that there is a problem. We want our voices heard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berman. Our next speaker is Demetra Howard. Good evening. Good, Good evening. evening. Well, how do you follow that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a teacher at Franklin also, and um, I want, I'm here to talk about the wonderful things that are happening at Franklin Middle School. I'm a special educator, and I'm a former, I'm a product of Baltimore City Schools. 
I've taught at Baltimore City, as a matter of fact, Harlem Park Middle for like nine years. So um, I've been teaching, at, I've happily been teaching at Franklin for six years, and to me there's no greener grass. Um, so I just want to let you all know about the wonderful things that are happening. Um, this year we offered eighth graders the opportunity to, to propose ideas for assemblies, after school, after school programs that they would plan and coordinate with an advisor. Students embraced this offer and spent several weeks brainstorming different ideas. Eventually they selected three activities that they wanted to undertake. So that, those activities were a Black History Month assembly, poster contest and a fashion show, which I personally led the fashion show, which turned out wonderful. I don't know if it was so wonderful because I um, was in charge of it, but or just the kids, which is, I'm just joking. I'm just trying to make things like. Um, <laughs> students work tirelessly during lunch and after school to coordinate, rehearse, and organize each of these events. Um, and additionally, students in the AVID program created resources that were shared with their peers during college and career month in October. We've offered many incentives for students who have adhered to the expectations of the BCPS handbook and the F um, FMS code of conduct. So one of those incentives was a laser tag party, which was in December, and students enjoyed competing against other homerooms to be named the laser tag champions. So we strive to make Franklin a place where all children feel welcome, respected, and appreciated. And if you would like to see all the great things that are happening every day at Franklin, you can follow us on Twitter at um, FMS um, underscore BCPS. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Howard. Our next speaker is Gail Bethard. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening, Ms. Johnson. Um, I come here from Franklin Middle School as well. And um, I come with some fellow parents, as you've noticed, some faculty from Franklin Middle School. And I have a little bit of both to tell you. From our, my first impression of Franklin Middle, we were happy. We came from a small elementary school. And we thought, wow, we get to meet so many different people, many walks of life, um, everybody coming together in one big school. However, that uh, changed very quickly as my son started sixth grade. Not only do I have a sixth grader who's now going into seventh, I also have a third grader who is going into fourth. And I'm very concerned for his future at Franklin Middle School. Um, some of our concerns were already discussed by Mr. Berman, um, but I, I have experienced some of them firsthand. I like to think I'm, an, I'm a concerned parent and I'm an involved parent, as I am sure some of you are as well. I sat there during American Education Week through all of my son's classes, and I was very concerned from what I've seen. Children roaming the halls, kids falling asleep in class, getting up, not even regarding the teacher. I was appalled as if they were my own children. And at a few occasions, I had to say something because it takes a village to raise our children. It's not just one of us. And one thing that I was told by a fellow parent which concerned me is this. Apparently last Friday, the administration made an announcement and told students that she was that um, the administration was going to give a voluntary homework assignment. Students were asked to write in 100 words or less why they love Franklin Middle School. It could be a poem, song, essay, or whatever they wanted. If they turned in the assignment by the next Monday, they would get a prize. Now, I don't know what this sounds like to you, but to me, I don't know, it doesn't sound kosher. So uh, instead of doing something like this, I think it's important that we need feedback. Feedback from the parents, feedback from the community on how we can make Franklin Middle School the school that we want it to be, the school that all the parents prepare for it to be when we send our children there. Um, I'm sure that many of you have children. And 
I'd like to hope that you can hear our plea from the parents that we want our children safe. We want to know when we send our kids to school every day that the administration and that the teachers have, will, and can keep our children safe at any cost. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> our next speaker is Mary Saltis. Hi, good evening. Thank good evening. you for giving me a chance to speak. Um, my name is Mary Soltes. I'm a parent volunteer at Franklin Middle School. Um, I am in charge of the school store. So I get to um, have the privilege of being in the school um, and see firsthand the behavior, the goods, the bads. And I do appreciate the good feedback um, that um, two teachers had come here to say, um, unfortunately, um, at a time like this, I come with concerns um, because I only have three minutes. And um, we don't feel heard as a group of parents that are concerned for the safety of our children. Um, their, the behavior in the hallways is unacceptable. That I see um, the language is horrific, um, obscene gestures, and it's not only to each other, it's to the teachers as well. There don't seem to be consequences um, that are disciplined, so the same, um, there, I'm sorry, there don't seem to be actions that are disciplined, the same, there aren't any consequences, the same things keep happening by the same students, um, is just watch your language and that's it, and that's a very minor offense, the more major offenses, um, we still are not seeing consequences to have. Um, the um, locked bathrooms has been an issue, and it's been for various different reasons. I'm an um, active member of the PTA. I've heard um, the good and bad, and I can see some of the reasons why they would lock bathrooms, but um, our students are missing class time to have to go to the bathroom, and um, there seems to be a better way of doing things. We would like to have more personnel. Um, available so the bathrooms don't have to be locked so um, kids feel safe to not um, have to go when there's um, big crowds or have to miss class work to go to the bathroom. Um, the hallways are very, very crowded. Um, we would suggest um, having some resources to um, maybe stagger the bells um, and have teachers available to police the hallways um, when the students are changing classrooms. Even the um, receptionists have told me, um, oh, you better hurry to get to the school store because the, mad, the mob is coming. Um, so they're even looking out for myself in that. Um, and we um, are here because we want to be heard by everybody, heard by our own administration, heard by you all, and um, we appreciate um, Ms. Johnson coming to our school last week. That was um, very, um, it meant a lot to us that we heard. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> our next speaker is Ms. Hazel Jones. Good evening, Board of Education members and Dr. Dance. I am here tonight in my continuous pursuit for educational justice. Last month, I informed the Board of Education and the community stakeholders that BCPS Rule 5580 pertaining to bullying, harassment, and um, intimidation was not being followed. I would like to thank BCPS and its quick response on, on finally um, completing the mandated report form that pertains to the bullying, harassment, and intimidation because it was filled out the next day. 
though I am thankful, but I still have received a will have not received a written resolution of four out of five incidents. The date no one has provided to date no one has provided a written report that either substantiates or does not substantiate the bullying, harassment, intimidation. Regarding one incident, I was told that there was no bullying, has harassment, limitation, intimidation, and told that I should not conf conflate the allegations with day-to-day -day student stipulations situations by the principal at Overly High School. I was offended by this and given the fact that alleged the, given the fact that alleged threats were made towards my daughter, I cannot accept the behavior as a normal day-to-day -day student situation. I have written and asked what the threats were, and no one from Overly High School will tell me. All I know is what was reported by the principal to me. He said the bullying, harassment, and the intimidation did not occur. I asked to appeal this decision and was told that his decision is following. There is no appeal for this decision. I I wish to inform you that sometimes principals do err and to do to not have a policy in place that of that affords the parents to question the decision or administrator does goes against all principles or integrity and transparency. This current um, practice of BCPS only ensures that bullying, harassment, and intimidation can go unreported and underreported. A policy needs to be put in place to allow for an independent review of all principal determinations. It is good, it is not good practice to allow principal investigation in his own cases of bullying, harassment, intimidation, and determine that no bullying, harassment, and intimidation did not occur. It is, it is this time of policy that should go should give us pause to learn that the scandal that happened at Penn State and and Baylor Baylor University people complained that either no no action or weak action was taken which resulted in children and students being hurt. I insist to transparency that I be told what the threats were made and that an independent investigation be conducted. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Glenn Gilhar. Good evening, Dr. Dance, uh, distinguished members of the Board of Education. Um, thank you all for the uh, hard work and, and volunteer work that you do for our schools and our community. Um, I'm coming here today to challenge our leadership and to challenge this board to amend Transportation Policy 3410. And Transportation Policy 3410, currently the guideline is, is to provide transportation services within one mile of um, elementary students and middle school students and a mile and a half, I think it is, or for, for the high school. So we moved the goalpost for our high school students. Um, recently, I had a former student um, who asked me to share a story with you. She says she was a, a student who went to uh, Parkville Middle School, and she received our transportation services as a middle school student. But um, when she went to the high school, as a direct result of this policy, she said that her house that she lived in with her parents was deemed ineligible for transportation services. So she said, well, what she did was she snuck down for ninth and 10th grade down to the bus stop down the road and hopped on, kind of you know, <laughs> slid down in the seat and hoped nobody would notice. And she says, got away with it for two years. And she says, in one day, she said, they did a bus check. And she says, the driver came through and said, you don't belong on this bus. And she put her off the bus. Um, as a result of that, she said she never went back. She said she went on to get her GED, but she said that with her family situation, um, having that uh, milestone move for, for high school uh, was, was a hardship on her and her family. And so, you know, given the option of, of riding a bus or not riding a bus meant the difference between graduating high school or not graduating high school. Um, so, you know, when, I, when she shared this story with me, she said, 
Glenn, you're wasting your breath because this policy will never change. Because when we look at our neighbors, our neighboring school districts, many of them don't offer transportation for high school at all. Hmm. Some of them, it's, it's two miles for elementary school and for middle school. So we're way ahead of a lot of the other school districts. But also when we look at these other school districts, they're also closing schools, laying off staff. Here in Baltimore County, we're building new schools. We're installing air conditioning. Um, and the President of the United States has made multiple visits to Baltimore County. Not because this is, you know, wonderful weather. No, he's coming here because he says, Baltimore County, you know, you guys do it right. And he looks at us uh, as an example for the nation, you know, not the other way around. So as uh, Dr. Dance earlier this week was talking about, you know, what can we do to help improve graduation re rates and help students get across the graduation stage? One way I think that we can do it, and based on the new technologies you're implementing, is by changing this rule. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gerhardt. <laughs> Thanks, John. Our next speaker is Katrina Swales. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I am here to discuss another program that we have at Franklin Middle School. My name is Katrina Swales, and I have been teaching at Franklin Middle School for three years now, eight years for Baltimore County. Last spring, I was approached by my principal, Mrs. Mall, with an offer I could not refuse, an opportunity to establish the AVID program at our school for the first time ever. For those of you who don't know what AVID is, it is a college readiness program designed to help underrepresented students develop the skills they need to be successful. Myself, along with my site team members, worked tirelessly all year long to give our two eighth grade elective classes, 38 students, experiences that they would otherwise not have been exposed to. We were so successful that next year we will be adding more sections and grade levels, 87th graders and 68 eighth graders. In the beginning of the year, we had the AVID students host our first college day fair in which they prepared presentations about different universities to share with their peers. This research sparked interest and desire. We asked them to present speeches in front of the class about their passions and their favorite places. This strengthened their public speaking skills. We encouraged them to participate in heated debates in which their opinions were heard, valued, and respected through Socratic seminars and philosophical chairs. This taught the students to provide evidence to back up their beliefs. We featured different careers by having outside professionals come in to speak about their jobs every Friday. This shone light upon what it was that they did on a daily basis, as well as the education necessary for these positions. We motivated the students to participate in team building activities. These scenarios made them go outside of their comfort zones to bond and support one another as a family. Additionally, the students were offered guidance to one another during our tutoring sessions twice a week. Here they worked in groups to solve problems from their academic classes that they were struggling with, and we even had a tutor come in biweekly to aid these groups. Our AVID students perfected their note-taking skills by practicing Cornell notes. Here the students were not only asked to take notes, but to interact with them, question them, summarize them. All of, them, all of this built their comprehension. They also took the time to organize their binders and their agendas to practice time management. Most importantly, we took college tours at Loyola University, UMBC, the University of Maryland College Park, and Morgan State. The students walked around the campuses, ate at the dining halls, visited dorm rooms, and attended basketball games. These experiences were life-changing. Now that the year is done, I've reflected about what my kids gained from being an AVID. They became more confident, determined, and excited about getting an education and going to college. This drive inspired them to seek extra help in their other classes, get involved in extra extracurricular activities, become leaders amongst their peers, and to make good choices when faced with adversity or conflict. This was our first generation. This is a legacy worth continuing. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> our next speaker is Lisa Donahoe. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Lisa Donahoe, and I'm the STAT teacher at Franklin Middle School. And I'm here tonight to tell you proudly about a learning and networking framework implemented at Franklin under the leadership of our principal, Charlene Mall.
It's called Franklin Institute. And I'm honored to illustrate how it defines our professional development and lends toward student achievement. Overall, teachers attend weekly workshops after school throughout the year to participate in learning the latest instructional models offered to STAT teachers. And it's important to share this good news because the energy and idea sharing among staff created through Franklin Institute is a part of the inspiration behind student achievement at Franklin Middle School. And it begins with teachers. Franklin Institute inspires teachers to share knowledge and work together. It's truly about teachers teaching teachers, and it allows us to rapidly network in and among departments and to shorten our learning curves as new ideas and methodologies are introduced to us. Another outcome of Franklin Institute is that we continue to develop teachers as leaders. Mrs. Ma encourages each of us to literally step up and become models for one another, and teachers have taken that lead. Enthusiasm is contagious. As teachers collect ideas, learn, and sharpen their instructional tools, they continuously use them during instruction. Besides learning software to enhance student learning, such as Edmodo, Nearpod, Plickers, BCPS1 tools, Quizlet, and BlendSpace, and so much more, we partner with central office staff to learn from them as well. One recent example is professional development from the Office of World Cultures. We invited a specialist to come and talk to us about a protocol called the QFT. This teaching strategy is designed to engage students with content at a deeper level than what you might expect with typical class discussions. Numerous teachers who attended were genuinely excited to implement the QFT and actually rewrote their lessons for the next day. Afterward, a language arts teacher emailed me and she wrote the following. As this was the first time we've ever done this, I asked students to tell me how they felt about the activity, and many, many of them said it really forced them to think more deeply and clearly about what they were reading. It was a great discussion. I was also pleased to note that many students, particularly students who don't often participate, wanted to share, and they told me that it made them feel free and able to express their ideas. And they also said that that activity built up their anticipation and excitement to read on. And a science teacher came to me the next day excited to share with me how he implemented what he learned from the PD as well. Look, these are just a few examples uh, inspired by Franklin Institute, and there are daily examples I could share with you. But let me conclude by saying Franklin Middle School embodies a teaching culture that instills camaraderie among staff and enhances the learning environment for all students. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker for the evening is Julie Romeo. Good evening, Dr. Dance, members of the board. Thanks for the opportunity to allow us to speak. Thank you. Um, I am also a parent of a student at Franklin Middle School and um, here to represent some of the parent concerns that uh, some of which have already been shared tonight. Um, I certainly appreciate the information from the teachers on the wonderful programs that are going on at Franklin. There's no doubt, you know, a wonderful contingent of hardworking teachers and great programs at the school. We're not here to argue that. We're here in support of coming up with or looking for direction for resolution for a lot of the issues that we're concerned about in terms of what our children are experiencing um, at school. Um, I have a sixth grader. I, ha I have another uh, student in fourth grade who will be coming to Franklin in two years. Um, I'm not by nature an activist. I don't expect perfection. I don't expect my kids to live in a bubble, but um, the, cumul the accumulation of the experiences that my son has had at school this year have caused me to say, at some point you cross a line and you say, it's not acceptable. It's, it's not acceptable anymore. Um, the, there seems to be a big issue with the administration acknowledging an issue to parents and communicating with us about what's going on. Um, even personally, things that my child has reported, you know, he, he comes home weekly and tells me about fights that are going on in school. Um, he has been pushed down a hill because he accidentally stepped on a child's sneaker. There was no witness to this. There was no communication to me. Um, he saw a fight between a young lady and a young man where she was punched and was bleeding in the hallway. I have not witnessed that, that myself in my whole adult life, and I don't think that's an acceptable culture for our children to be living in. I just I think it's upsetting for all of our students. Um, he was also witness to another fight in his gym class. He was called to the principal's office to give a witness account. 
I was not contacted as a parent. Why was I not contacted? Why that just doesn't make any sense to me. I should have been told what was going on. Um, many parents of younger kids are asking me. Um, they're they're concerned about sending their kids to Franklin. Parents of kids in my my younger son's uh, class. And I wish I could say, it's a great school. Don't be worried, but I can't. And I'm really worried about the reputation that our school is getting in our community. I think there's a huge contingent of support and parents and families and stakeholders who want to make things better, but we need to work with administration and we want our voices heard. We want somehow for there to be some resolutions to say, how do we, how do we get a group together to work with administration and say, yeah, there are a lot of great things at this school, but there are issues that need to be addressed. We can't pretend that these things aren't happening. Our students deserve better. Our teachers deserve better. It's not acceptable. And I just hope your voices have been heard tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next agenda item is uh, new business personnel matters, and we'll call Dr. Mayo forward. Good evening, Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chair Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board. I would like consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, certificated appointments, and Area Education Advisory Council appointments. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Do I have a motion to approve exhibits J1 through J5? So moved. Mr. Was, President, yes. I'd like to um, abstain from retirements. Okay. Mr. You're going to abstain? There's a family member involved in it. All right. So it's been moved. Uh, is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and second. Any questions at this time? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Thank you. Our uh, next agenda item is consideration of administrative appointments. Dr. Dance. Uh, Chairman McDaniels, members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. <coughs> principal Old Court Middle School, Assistant Principal Middleborough Elementary School, Executive Director of School Support, Manager, Office of Risk Management, Senior Operations Supervisor, and Op Office of Operations, Supervisor of Leadership Development and Department of Organizational Effectiveness, Community Superintendent, Superintendent's Designee in the Department of Student Support Services, Coordinator of Visual Arts in the Office of Social Studies, Fine Arts, and World Languages, and Information Security Engineer in the Department of Information Technology. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit K? So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. The move in a second. Any questions? All right, I'll ask Question. Ms. Miller. Um, I'd really just a, a comment. Yes. Um, when we were approving the um, new structure for the community superintendents uh, back in April, there was you know a lot of discussion and concern about um, that structure and, and how it added layers. Um, and when we um, when some of the questioning had to do with where those new, um, how those new positions would be filled, and I had the understanding that they would be filled internally, and it might have been a misguided understanding, but uh, I went back and watched the video from that meeting, and um, it was it was a bit vague. Um, I was a little surprised to see that we were bringing in someone from Houston. I don't have any particular concerns about this person, but I am concerned about um, the fact that this person is not familiar with the community as a community superintendent. Um, I think um, we have 
valuable employees in the system and could probably have filled it internally. I wish we had. Um, and, and I just wanted to express that when we approved that new structure, I thought it was with the understanding that we would be filling those positions internally. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Are there any other questions about the motion at this time? If not, I would ask all those in favor of uh, Exhibit K approving, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Dr. Dance. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I would like to introduce a few new people uh, to Team BCPS, but also to um, introduce individuals who are going to be new in their positions. First is for the assistant principal position at Middleborough Elementary School, currently right now a reading specialist at Kingsville Elementary School. That's Sharon Fisher. And Sharon, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Congratulations, Mike. <laughs> Next is for the coordinator of visual arts in the Office of Social Studies, Fine Arts, and World Languages. Currently right now an art teacher at Patapsco High School and Center for the Arts. That's Sherry Fisher. <laughs> and Sherry, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? I do have my parents. And they can stand up. Hi. Stand up mom and dad. Yeah. Congratulations to both of you as well. Next is for the Supervisor in Leadership Development in the Office of Organizational Effectiveness. Currently right now the Chief Academic Officer for Friendship Education Foundation. That's Tanya Green. <laughs> Tanya, you, sang us, you seem very excited. We're excited <laughs> to have you. Um, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? I have an awesome team here though. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I see Billy with a smile as well too. Next is for a superintendent's designee in the Department of Student Support Services, currently right now a PPW at Battle Grove Elementary School. That's Paul Muller. <laughs> Paul, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? My wife, Kira, and my mom, Martin Muller. Oh, great. Congratulations <laughs> to both of them. Next is for the principalship position at Old Court Middle School, currently right now an assistant principal at Southwest Academy. That's Dr. Katina Webster. Dr. Webster, other than Karen, who's very, very excited next to you, do you have any other family or friends here with you tonight? <laughs> Stand up, Karen, so I can embarrass you for a little bit. So, Karen, how many, Karen, how many principals have you like developed within the school system? That's she's being she's being gracious. There are probably at least about 20 people who I talk to who've had some type of contact with Karen, who they've received development from her. So, thanks, Karen, for the. Oh, you're saying from Southwest? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Karen, Karen corrected me. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Barnes. Next is for the senior operations supervisor in the Office of Operations. Currently, right now, a field representative in the Office of Operations. That's Bill Winger. Any family or friends here with you tonight? Congratulations, Megan, for both of you. <laughs> Next is for the Executive Director of School Support, currently right now the principal of Overly High School. That's Dr. Marquise Dorothy. <laughs> Dr. Dorothy, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Understand. Congratulations, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Next is for the Information Security Engineer in the Department of Information Technology, currently right now an IT specialist at Hostling International. That's Aladipo Aladapo. <laughs> and Aladipo, did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes, close enough. No, what, no, what is it? No, please uh, pronounce it for us. It's Aladipo Aladapo. Yes, sir. Uh, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? <laughs> uh, 
And this, Mr. Chair, members of the board, that's uh, the individuals who are in attendance tonight. I do look forward to introducing uh, the board to Dr. Craig Crayar, who's right now an assistant superintendent with the Houston ISD system in Texas, who will be one of our community superintendents. And while the board does not necessarily have to approve its list as a transfer, I would like to congratulate um, Yvonne Barheit, the principal of Hawthorne Elementary School, and Jennifer Mullinex, the principal of Halstead Academy, who will be two of our directors of school performance. Thank you, Dr. Nance. Our next agenda item is uh, consideration of action taken in closed session, and for that I'll call forth Mr. Nussbaum. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Earlier, earlier this evening, the board considered an appeal regarding a confidential student matter in your quasi-judicial capacity. It was cons the matter was considered on the record as there was no request made for oral argument. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the actions taken by the board in closed session in that matter, which was hearing examiner number 16-57. Thank you, Mr. Nussbaum. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? So moved. Second? Second. Uh, any discussion at this time? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Nussbaum. The order's Nussbaum. on the table over there. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair? I yes. just want to say one thing for board members. Board Docs is up and running now. Okay. Not for me. Huh? Not for me. All right. Thank you. All right. Our next agenda item is new business contract awards. Um, and I'll turn that over to Mr. Gillis at this time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do have a point of order about these, about some of these contracts. Um, I know a number of these have reference to the uh, curriculum committee having approved this matter. Hmm. And um, I had the opportunity to, to uh, attempt to speak with the person who took the draft minutes. I followed it up uh, with a conversation with uh, her, her boss, which is uh, our chief academic officer. And my understanding was that there was no formal approval vote for any of this in the curriculum committee, where it's indicated that this was approved uh, by the um, curriculum committee. And these contracts, uh, uh, I count at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven um, that say they were approved when in fact uh, there's no record of any vote. And the second piece to this is the committee that I'm on, anything that we do in our committee, we have to bring it to the board and have it approved right. because the committee is not the board. So one, why do we use this language, was approved if, it, if there wasn't a vote, and two, if there was a vote, then why wasn't it brought to the board so then the board can decide if that's going to be the board action instead of using this confusing type language, to my mind anyway, that these contracts have somehow been already approved by a curriculum committee. Yeah. Well, they certainly aren't, are not approved by the curriculum committee. The only thing we would do is, is approve it to be passed on to the full board. Um, the contracts are certainly not approved by just the curriculum committee. Yeah, but I'm saying there's no vote to approve them. Well, you take a look at the draft minutes, it doesn't say that there was even a vote taken. And if there's no vote taken, then what I want to know is why do we use this language was approved? If the language is going to be the curriculum committee looked at this and took no action, well, then at least that's being intellectually honest. But to pretend, to presume, to suggest, to imply, to in any way let folks believe that somehow another committee has had a look at this and has put a good housekeeping seal of approval just is intellectually dishonest. Mm -hmm. Well. well Go ahead, Maris. Maris also, uh, uh, so chair. as the chair of the committee, we do review all of these con all of the contracts that come to us. We do not officially vote, so that wording can be changed, and it's something that our committee will be discussing whether or not we do want to decide to have a vote and that then to the contracts committee. We do um, we're not just you know, we're not, they're not just presented to us. We do have a, a conversation about them. We do ask our questions. We come prepared for the, for the meeting. So is there a vote? No. But are we having discussion and putting our unofficial stamp of approval? Yes. But it is an unofficial stamp of approval. Uh, just for the parents that are out there whose children will be affected should these contracts be approved tonight and ultimately be implemented, where can they go and see a copy of the unofficial seal of approval? Is that on the website someplace? Is there a special place they can go to somehow feel more comfortable with it? No, sir, there's not. Thank you for your directness. Okay, thank you. Um, Excuse me, Chair. May I comment? on that um, yes yeah. uh, just to let you know that that was brought up in the building and contracts committee meeting that we had earlier today 
uh, from three to five. Um, I do want to say I believe it's a it's it's not efficient to have our building and contracts committee meetings right in front of the open board meetings because then the work that we do we can't communicate to the rest of the board members before you have to come and take a vote. So um, we did. I did bring that up because I agree with you that the language needs to be appropriate so that other board members and the public can understand exactly how the committees work <clears throat> and whether in fact a vote was taken to approve of moving that material forward to be then voted on by the rest of the board. So um, I'm glad to hear, um, Ms. Johnson, that in within your committee that that discussion about clarification will take place. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clasen. Okay. Um, I also wanted to make another general comment about the contracts before we start discussing them. I had um, sent information last week, um, as I was uh, asked to do by Dr. Dance, to get in my questions early so that the staff would have time to take care of them. And uh, the staff did a great job. As I said, we met earlier from 3 to 5, and we had a very um, constructive meeting, and I appreciate all of the staff's help. Um, I did ask questions that uh, the superintendent decided not to give me answers to, which are going to affect some of uh, the discussion I'll be having and the votes I'll be taking, which is that there are three initiatives uh, that have taken place um, that are in some form of limbo. I do not know the exact form because I have not been informed despite having asked questions uh, about these. Um, so those are... Um, the scholarship program, the print management, and also the uh, infinite campus um, contracts that were rather significant when they were approved. Uh, one was 25 million, one was 10 million, and one was 5 million 300. And I know I have personal experience with these, and I sent an email to the rest of the board members. I have personal experience with these as a parent, so it's not just uh, one disgruntled employee or former employee that's informing uh, the work that I bring to the board, but in fact, it's hundreds and, and actually thousands as I read all of the emails that come through, listen to all of the comments, and when someone sends us a petition that's for a 1,000 or more signatures or so forth, I read it and acknowledge it. So I just want to say in the future, I really would like to get answers to the questions, and I specifically believe that the board should understand um, what happens with new initiatives so that we can learn from the past, so that we can make better future decisions, and if there are ongoing contract negotiations or possible legal implications, the board should be involved of that. If there's legal situations, we have an opportunity in closed session where we can get advice from our uh, legal representatives um, so that we can understand how these contracts work. One of the things that we've heard multiple times when we discuss these contracts from our staff is that for these lengthy year contracts that we can cancel the contracts if they're not working out or if our funding priorities change. But in fact, that is not quite the case all the time. So I would just ask board members to really consider that. And I would ask uh, the superintendent to please respond to my email to the rest of the board. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Saris, Mr. Dixon. No, no, bad, no bad, oh, bad, you, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Wow. So. Um, the contract building and contracts committee met today from three o'clock to five o'clock. The building and contracts committee is Ms. Causey, Mr. Stewart, Senator Collins, and myself. We reviewed all 31 contracts. I'm pleased to now present all 31 contracts to this board to vote. And I'll tell you that the um, the 31 were uh, passed by the four-person building and con contracts committee unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Uh, do I have a motion to approve items M1 through M31? That was my motion. That was oh, my sorry. motion. Okay. Second. Uh, I know second is, is needed. All right, is there a discussion at this time? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to have one of those broken out, and that is the um, uh, MBU 52516. I'm not sure I understand. What, what number is that? That's uh, MBU. That's what? the um, computer immersion. Which one is it, Steve? It's um, 12. number hearing, 12. I'm hearing that it's, that it's 12. M12. All right. All right. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, Ms. Uh, Miller? Can we also break out number seven, please? M7. All right. And Ms. Causey? Can we break out number five, eight, and 19 for discussion?
All right. Um, then uh, I will ask if we can then. I'm sorry. No, I'm saying one to four. Okay, yeah, yeah M1 one through we... M4, six. M3, M6, six. M, M9 through uh, M11, M13 through M18, and then M20 through M31. I'm sorry. I need to ask you to separate out item 30. All right. Maybe we should uh, discuss the results. No, no, no. Okay. All right. I, well, I again, move, I move that we uh, vote to accept one M one two three four six nine ten eleven thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen twenty twenty one twenty two twenty three twenty four twenty five twenty six twenty seven twenty eight twenty nine and thirty. One. Thirty one. One. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, any discussion on that uh, motion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. So all those numbers that Mr. Gillis read off have been approved. <laughs> and uh, I guess we'll start with the lowest number, um, M5. Uh, there was a request to break out M5. Is that you, Ms. Causey, that asked for M5? That is me. Thank you very much. Um, my point on this one is that it is a program that we've been using just recently, and we have not received in writing documentation of the program growth. I was glad to hear from a teacher earlier, um, but we have in the Building and Contracts Committee meeting, just like I said, from three to five, had uh, one, only one uh, example of growth, extended year learning program. Um, so I would just, um, and, th and this was one of those contracts where it said it was approved when in fact it was discussed. Um, so I would just hesitate to um, extend a contract for this amount of money uh, for this length of time without seeing in writing that this program is in fact providing significant value to the students. All right. Any other discussion on uh, M5? Can I ask a question? Do we know how many students uh, is presented with this program or a rough number? Thousands? Hundreds? Um, it's um, schools, 50 schools? Mr. Yulfelder, thank you for your question. So uh, just to answer the other questions as well, this program has been used not only um, as small group instruction support through our extended year learning um, program, but also in the AMA um, program as well. So it has shown positive um, student growth in our um, accelerated math achievement, which is another contract that you have before you. This is part of the blended learning approach for that. And I'll let Dr. Staley talk about the actual numbers. Yeah, this year in middle school, the program was used with about 4,800 students. Most of those students were used in the Lighthouse School. So students in Lighthouse, um, we had licenses for those students. Each middle school also had additional licenses to use and uh, the support classes for students in seventh grade and eighth grade, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. This was also used with um, a few high schools for about 112 students. What, you, what we see um, in the different levels is students' movement across the levels, and, and we have, I have a paper report of that that I can get to Ms. White and we can move to you future, for the future. But th for this year was the main first year of use within the school day. Um, in previous times, we've used it in the summer program. We've, it's been a main part of the blended piece for the Accelerated Math Achievement program also. Thank you. Any other questions on M5? I move that we accept M5. All right. There are no other questions. I would ask all those in favor of uh, accepting M5, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? One opposed? Two. Two, Two opposed? Uh, the motion carries. Um, M5 carries. The next item broken out was M7. I don't recall yes, if that, that was me. Thank okay. you. 
Uh, first, I, I just wanted to make a general comment. I have a lot of serious concerns about having such a huge number of contracts going through at one time. I think it's difficult for the board to do its due diligence with that many contracts. Um, and they represent, I believe, about $200 million. So um, we really need more time to consider that amount of contracts and that amount of dollars. Um, on number seven, I have a few questions um, about that contract. Is this for those specific five hearing examiners that are listed, or is it just in general? For all for these five. For those five, okay. And we are at this time just getting ready to evaluate our board employees. And it's my understanding that we have not evaluated hearing examiners for something like 10 years. Is that correct? I wouldn't say evaluate is an accurate statement. I would say you have not reappointed or appointed new hearing examiners in approximately 10 years. About how long has it been since we have evaluated any of them? I don't know that there's been a formal evaluative process. What the board has done when it's been displeased with hearing examiners And, and just yes. for your information, uh, we're, uh, in uh, November, uh, we're going to put on an RFP, and we're going to decide if we want to hire them again for next year. So, so, okay. uh, so the issue that you and I both have, I think, you know, with a lot of the uh, of the decisions that are made, will will be addressed in, in, in that way. There wasn't time to put out a new RFP and, and go through the process for, the, for uh, that. So this is just for next school year. Uh, so, I think we kind of. Um, at least I think I'm satisfied with the way we're going to be addressing it. I'm not trying to tell you not to ask your questions, but I, I'm not trying to tell you not to ask your questions, but I just wanted to let you know that, that that's what, what uh, we talked about in, in uh, the contracts committee. I appreciate that. And so are you satisfied with an extension of term of one year, or is it possible to do a shorter term? Well, I, I think, I, yeah, I'm satisfied with the one year. Um, I mean, I would be happier if we were able to do it this year, but. With the reality of things, uh, I think we, uh, I'm satisfied with, with one year, not thrilled but satisfied. Okay. And I just wanted to understand that contract. Absolutely. I move that Thank we you. accept M7. Okay. Uh, if there's any further discussion, uh, all those in favor of accepting item M7, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. So we have M8. M8, was that Ms. Causey? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, again, I just want to say that this is a uh, another new software product um, that has been used. Um, the board has received um, many emails of concern, um, research that has been sent to us from doctors, parents, and so forth about. Um, potential excessive use. It's one of the softwares uh, that parents were concerned about that prompted the um, board to consider creating its own safety and technology committee, uh, but the board ended up approving for two board members to um, sit in on the central office's safety and technology committee um, to discuss such things as screen time and the effects of um, software and so forth on the students. So again, I would say that um, I have not been given in writing um, any documentation that documents the, the uh, improvement of the students of this method over any other method to extend the contract and um, increase the, um, the budget. Any other uh, questions or discussion on M8? I move we accept M8. All right, no further question. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. No. Any opposed? Opposed. Opposed. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, the next uh, item separated is M12. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, I just wanted to um, note that, of course, this was 
not, uh, this was not a contract that was subject to competitive bid. Could you take just a moment and share with uh, the folks here tonight and my fellow board members, you may already have done this with the buildings and contracts committee members. We did. As to, as to then the shortened version, as to uh, why this was uh, not uh, competitively bid. I can tell you that uh, generally curriculum is not competitively bid. We sometimes do requests for proposals in which we will evaluate uh, proposals based on a number of criteria, one of which is price. But that is not a requirement uh, under state or uh, local regulations. And most often curriculum is uh, accepted uh, based on the research and the review of the division of curriculum and instruction and discussed uh, with the curriculum committee, committee uh, as it considers each particular item. And Mr. Sarris, you said mostly. Was that in fact done in this particular contract? No, there was not an RFP done in no, this no, case. No, but I mean it, in terms of review and, and, and the like, was that done with this contract? Yes, Very in good. accordance with uh, board policy and rule 6002. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my sense is uh, because of some of the feedback I received from the community uh, and parents whose children are attending or will attend uh, uh, Cromwell Valley Elementary School, one of the one of the two schools that uh, would receive the benefit, depending on your viewpoint, of this contract, um, that there's really kind of two issues here, and one is. The, the overall magnet scope uh, at, um, uh, say, CVE and at, I believe it's um, Chatsworth, the other school. And then there's the other piece to it, which is this one type of software which is contemplated with this uh, particular contract. Uh, I want to thank uh, the superintendent and his staff for their responsiveness uh, to the inquiries that were made about this contract. Um, I'm, I'm satisfied that uh, they have done their due diligence in this regard and that it is not the only uh, software that would be used uh, by students uh, who attend this, uh, this magnet, these two magnet schools. Secondly, um, there is a renewed commitment uh, on the part of uh, the um, uh, central office and uh, the um, administration more particularly then to um, solicit additional input from parents whose children are attending so that uh, we all have the benefits not just of the software going forward but we have the benefits of um, the input of those most directly affected uh, the children and their parents and I want to thank the administration for doing that and thank you for allowing me to like break this out and ask these questions of the two presenters. Thank you, Mr. Birch. Uh, Mr. Collins? Uh, just, just to add, uh, uh, Steve, to your uh, knowledge base as well, um, I brought up uh, uh, Mrs. Rowe's specific concerns, and I know they've been addressed in writing by, by the staff, uh, by the superintendent, and we had a robust discussion. And also, uh, Margaret Ann pointed out and uh, that it's actually in the code that we don't have to uh, have have competitive bids for curricular items. I had heard that before, but forgot it, and um, so we, we had a robust discussion in the uh, in in the uh, rules com uh, in the contracts committee, and <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, I'm very comfortable that that a good choice has been made, and um, that there that there also there has been a lot of contact with the community, uh, the parent community, not about which particular item to use in the curriculum about with the whole concept of, of the uh, of the magnet so uh, I feel I feel uh, satisfied and I just wanted you to know and Lily as well to know since I know her um, that uh, we took her her uh, concern uh, seriously discussed it at length Ms. Walia did you have a yeah. comment just I mean, we've heard a lot about the Kano so can you give a little more information of what that is and like how is that different from code for the future I know Dr. Dance has said a memo, but like just for the community to know. I will start and then I'll ask uh, Mr. Imbriali to help me out. But uh, Cano is a product. It's a coding product and it's a kit basically. And so what Code to the Future does is it provides a solution to not only for the coding but for the professional development and for the coaching that goes along with how to incorporate computer science into daily instruction. So that, that, that in, um, therein lies the difference between just the product 
and having the product with the coaching and support and with the um, holistic approach to uh, coding overall in instruction. Okay. Ms. Miller? Um, I understand that it's not a requirement to bid this out, but nothing stops us from bidding it out, correct? Correct. I mean, this is a million dollar contract. It would seem to me that that would be uh, a valid consideration. I'm also very concerned about um, the issues that have been expressed by a number of our community members and parents. Um, and I would really like to see some of these other options being explored, as well as <clears throat> more input given, uh, you know, received from the community. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Any other? Yes, Ms. Causey. Um, I just wanted to point out two things. In the Building and Contracts Committee, when this was discussed, I had asked a question earlier, how long had this um, um, company been used and uh, across how many school districts and we did receive the information that um, <clears throat> verbally that it's been used in 75 school districts across the country um, but this past school year is the only year that it's it's been in a school program the whole year in other um, in previous years my understanding it's been summer camps and and um, you know short uh, spans of things and then I also received um, an email that um, that I want to ask. They're saying that there's um, Code of the Future has posted their LinkedIn account for the Baltimore position, which requires a bachelor uh, degree in anything. Um, certification of teaching is not necessary. Um, so I'm wondering how do you how does the staff know what employee of Code to the Future is going to be providing this? Um, program to our to our system is it someone that they actually haven't hired yet and so we're going to get someone that's new to them and then they're new to us um, again it just seems like um, a pretty young company a young program and um, we may end up being the guinea pigs on a four-year contract but the coaching scenario from code to the future code to the future does is responsible for hiring the coach who provides those services and then the school system would be a uh, part of that hiring process to ensure that we have the right kind of coach who's providing that support to our district um, that coach position that's being asked for by code to the future wouldn't just serve this district uh, code to the future is also um, embarking on contracts with other districts right around us as well Any other questions on M12? I move we accept M12. All right. Um, all those in favor of accepting M12, please raise your hand. Mr. Chairman, at the point of order, I think you need to have a second. You don't Go to the committee. Okay. All right. Thank you. I would second it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm going to ask all in favor of item M12, please raise your hand. Those opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Uh, the next item for discussion is M19. Okay. Ms. Causey, is that you? Yes, that's me. Um, I just wanted, uh, since this is again a, um, a new contract, a larger contract, I did just want to discuss it. Um, we had received. Um, Emails concerned about uh, the the ability to have textbooks, and it was discussed um, in Building and Contracts Committee. And so I just wanted to um, reiterate and have Miss um, White reiterate what was discussed, which is that there will be textbooks available in um, the uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade classes and the Algebra One, um, and that the um, for the for the most part, the sixth graders will have the digital material because they have the devices, but if an IEP requires it or a parent um, desires it, then a student would have ability to uh, use a textbook. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Virch. 
It's my intention to support this contract. However, uh, one of the folks who put their name in the box and was not chosen was a Dumbarton Middle School student. His name is uh, Graham Lucas. And Graham left with, uh, with me, and each one of you have it, and he has personally signed it. So it's from Graham the Man, and I, I want to thank him. He wrote the following. I personally have found that when I used an online math book at the beginning of the year, it would take me 35 to 45 minutes to understand the material. However, when I started using physical textbook, it would take me 20 to 25 minutes to understand the material with the same level of thoroughness and achievement later on. Because of this, my grades and other classes have improved due to more time to study. Um, I commend to uh, my colleagues uh, that if they have the time to review Graham's well-written and well-reasoned comments as to his experiences with text versus uh, textbooks versus online math books. Thank you, Mr. Birch. We all have that. Um, and yes, Mr. Collins. I, I just want to quickly uh, say, Steve, we had a, also had a great discussion about making sure everyone has the availability of textbooks, either at the student's request or at the parent's request, and they can take them home. They may have to bring them back if there's only a, a classroom set, but uh, uh, sometimes they'll even have them that they, they can keep at home. And just while I have the floor, one before we finish, Mr. Chairman, I do want to remind all of all of you on the board with uh, with us that. Um, and I don't say this as a wise guy at all, because I never did it before I was a member of the committee. But all of all of our meetings are open, you know. So if you have a chance to get here early, uh, you're more than welcome to come and listen to us. You can hear uh, Kathleen and I just uh, debating over which one of us talks the most. <laughs> there is no debate. <laughs> you know, you win. I move we accept M19. All right. Um, motion. All in favor of accepting M19, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. The last item to uh, discuss is M30, and I know that's Ms. Causey. Remember that. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a, um, it's a contract for Educational Facilities master's Master Plan and the Comprehensive Maintenance Plan. Um, again, this is an issue uh, for me of getting information in a timely fashion <coughs> and able to read it, ask questions, get answers, deliberate to make decisions that actually provide oversight and um, will help make decisions for the board um, that will actually help all of the students and the teachers in an equitable fashion, but also one that are um, fiscally responsible because we do have a limited number of dollars. We do, are not our own funding authority and we have a great many needs that we're trying to take care of um, all across the county. So I would just um, outline that the comprehensive maintenance plan is uh, not due until October 14th, 2016. Um, and I'm going to be voting against it because I did not have time to read the whole thing, much less ask or get questions answered. Um, also the, um, so in terms of building and contracts committee trying to do our due diligence for, for the other board members, I am not recommending to you that you vote for it because I did not do, I did not have the opportunity to um, do my due diligence. Um, also, the Educational Facilities Master's Plan, we did talk about it in the Building and Contracts Committee, and in fact, it is not updated yet to the uh, recent capital construction changes that have been um, initiated through the County Executive and the County Council through April 14th press release and also a May 18th press release. So although we are headed in the right direction of acknowledging uh, the inequities of many schools that have not had air conditioning, we're definitely headed in the right direction. Um, it's not correct, number one, and even though we were uh, informed that we would get updates, um, that has not been the case in the past. So uh, we, based on the capital construction request that we voted on in September, then it was changed in uh, November, and with five minutes' notice, we were asked to vote on it. And um, then what was actually um, submitted to the state was different than what the board voted on. So um, for those reasons, I'm not going to vote on something that, number one, I know is already incorrect. And um, I will be happy to vote on it when corrections are made and if I receive an update. So those are my comments. Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Gillis. Uh, three things. One, um, during our 
Building and Contracts Committee, it was presented to us that these documents are filed with the state and they are updated over the course of time as the review goes on and the representatives from the school system have told us that they are in the process of updating. Number two, these things historically are both presented to this board in June for vote. Um, and again, they're presented to this board for vote. And number three, at least one of them is due to the Department Secretary of the Department of Planning of the state on July 14 before our next meeting. Um, so for all those reasons, uh, these are things that are wholly appropriate. We're not the funding source for any of this. This is just a, um, a capital process. So um, as Mr. As Senator Collins said during our Building and Contracts Committee, um, these are things that we just are uh, um, not the most important player in the process. It's the state, it's the county, um, and uh, these are things that need to be approved and moved on. And really all we're doing is we're, we're voting on blind, blind faith as opposed to no faith. So I recommend blind faith because this is just a process that goes on and it's not, it's, uh, it's a very important ultimate end, but it's also a moving target all the time. That's just the way government works, um, as exciting as it is. Ms. Miller? Um, Mr. Gillis, which of those is due next month in July? I think it's the facilities. Um, and I'd just like to respond to Senator Collins' statement. I find that extremely disconcerting that he would make a statement like that. Well, I'm sorry that Ann finds that disconcerting, but I've always, uh, I've always believed in telling the truth, uh, Ann. And uh, I'm sorry that if you uh, uh, don't, uh, if you find that disconcerting, but. Uh, um, I really don't know how to make you feel better other than to tell you that that is the way government works. And, um, you know, we are having faith in our system and our people who have done this for years. It's always worked out satisfactorily. And this is a procedural kind of thing. And it has nothing to, and, and, uh, and actually, um, uh, to say that Kathleen is correct, we don't know the details. If she's also correct, as all of us know, that they're changing constantly. But that's, that, that is still, so what we're doing is we're accepting, um, maybe I should say on faith, but I think if you don't see it and have read it, it's, it's actually quite accurate to say we're accepting it on blind faith, which is, which is okay, because it's what we have always had to do in this kind of a thing. And um, I think it's much more important to do it that way than to say we don't have any faith in our system, because I happen to have a lot of faith in them, even though, as you know from my last five years on the board, I can be very critical when I think it's necessary. Um, but I think in this case, this is a procedural thing. It's not a big deal, and we shouldn't um, change the process of how we go and uh, have, how we've been operating with this particular item in the past, in my all my years on the board, and probably many before that. This is not a big deal. Um, if you find that disconcerting, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry. I don't like to make anyone feel, uh, feel uncomfortable, but um, um, get over it. <clears throat> I move we accept M30. All right. Um, at this time, I'll ask for those in favor of item M30 to please raise your high hand. Okay. Those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, and I think that um, takes care of all of the items. Thank you, Mr. Dixit and Mr. Saris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Our next agenda item is new business uh, report on policies, and for that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Williams. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Good evening. Thank you, Chairman McDaniels. As chair of the Policy Review Committee, I'm happy and pleased to present seven uh, policies for first reader. Before I do so, I just want to take this opportunity to thank my fellow board members, uh, Vice Chair Marisol Johnson, Steve Birch, and Kathleen Causey, as well as staff members Margaret Ann Howe, Michelle Primo, and Patty Clark. PRC um, has a lot of responsibility, and we take that responsibility very seriously. Tonight, we are recommending um, for first reader only. Policy 4100, 4103, 4402, 5440, 6303, 6306, and 7520 to be moved forward for second reader. They are presented tonight as agenda item exhibit N. Um, I will speak a little bit more about 6303. That is our um, 
proposed heat policy, but at this time we are just asking um, Mr. Chairman that these policies be moved forward and that discussion can be provided later. And if anyone has any um, other recommendations or changes, that they are encouraged to submit them. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Um, do I have a motion then to adopt the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee to move these items forward? So move. All right. Can I um, ask a question about 6303? Certainly. Um, what I was hearing was that there was going to be sort of an addendum attached to that to send recommendations regarding the rule on that and that that might include um, a requirement to collect uh, classroom temperatures in the unair conditioned classrooms. Is that the case? Um, I can go over some of the highlights, but that's not my understanding. Um, okay. Okay. All right. I would like to see that in that policy. So, I mean, we th there is some reference to, um, you know, principals having the flexibility to move students, but to clarify, if it's appropriate. Now, I'd like us to just do this motion, and then I can go over some of these highlights because you can always ask that kind of thing to be addressed in second reader. Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, I don't know because it's never really been clarified exactly when we are allowed to speak. Well, but I am saying, I am telling you that now, that second reader, you can submit it in writing, you can, you know, this is just the first reader. Um, and in fact, um, news media wanted to speak about this policy and I wanted to make sure I presented it to my fellow board members prior to doing that because I believe that's the appropriate process since this is only a first reader. Okay. All right, is there any other discussion about the policies to move forward? If, if not, I'd ask all those in favor to please say aye. 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 Any opposed? So the motion carries. So if I may just talk a little bit about some points about the heat closure. Um, I do want to share that um, that it's part of, because I, and I want to do this so that it will help perhaps in terms of any uh, subsequent information that's needed um, by the public for clarification purposes. Um, this was part of PRC's work um, based on the September 15, 2015 charge. Uh, to PRC to make a recommendation for the need for a policy governing the closing of schools due to heat and humidity. Uh, it's very important that the public be reminded that we did seek public uh, response. We had a public hearing, in fact, on January, January 12th. Um, we also had a lot of input and support from parents. Um, I don't want to start naming names, but um, the, the public was very helpful and very informative in terms of what PRC finally is going to be recommending um, for approval. Some of the um, highlights of the policy, I, first let me just acknowledge that, the, that we support comfortable environments conducive to teaching and learning, and as a result, um, the policy is recommending that all schools close when the heat index is forecast to reach at least 90 degrees by 11 a.m. All schools will dismiss early when the heat index is forecast to reach at least 90 degrees by 2 p.m. All students will be allowed to carry water bottles at all times, regardless of heat or air conditioning status. Principals have the flexibility to move students to cooler rooms or other appropriate areas, such as the auditorium, multipurpose room, library, or shaded outdoor areas. There was some discussion about um, taking temperatures in the, the classroom, and PRC thought that was not um, a good recommendation. Um, and, um, you know, if someone wants to submit information that would somehow be persuasive that it is, but I can tell you that was not something that PRC thought was um, necessarily appropriate. Uh, also announcements that schools are dismissing early due to heat uh, will be made no later than 8 p.m. the evening prior to closure. The superintendent is authorized uh, to cancel all school-sponsored activities based on weather conditions, and the uh, policy 
review committee um, is requesting um, the board support for implementation of that uh, policy for next year. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Ms. Um, Williams, can you elaborate on why did, did the committee not support that? What? The, the taking of temperatures in the classrooms? Well, as I recall, um, and other board members, uh, I'm sorry, the committee members can pitch in. There was a lot of discussion about it, and I think there was some discussion whether or not this would be a responsibility that would be an additional responsibility on the teachers and whether or not the unions, this was something else that they would have to be um, compensated for. Was this an additional duty and how that situation would be addressed? We, we weren't opposed to it as a as an act, but we just were concerned with the fiscal implications of making that kind of recommendation, as I recall. Mm -hmm. And I think it was, rather than being in the policy, it might have gone in with the letter. The, right. right the, the letter right. afterwards that Dr. Dance was going to send out as a recommendation to um, principals and staff, but it wasn't going to go actually in the policy. So it is still something that the board recommends. However, it's not going to be in the policy itself. Mr. Birch, did you uh, have uh, a... Just very briefly, I would note in the, in the law, and I want to thank uh, Marisol for her comment, which I thought was really right on, on point. Uh, this really is uh, an issue of, of, to use a Venn diagram where policy and rule overlap. A subject for our retreat, which you, I understand, are unable to attend, uh, this issue of governance versus administration, that is one of the topics at our retreat. It's good that we have this discussion, but uh, that's a type of administrative matter that could, uh, assuming it uh, has a certain uh, level of solvency with it, that's easily a matter that could be accommodated in a rule. But that is not always the role of the policymakers. We also have the administrators. And um, as I say, uh, it's unfortunate that you won't be able to attend our retreat because I think uh, it, would be, it would be good for all of us to explore that and uh, to hear from all of our board members. But we all have our schedule, so I'm sure it'll surface again as we go forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And Ms. Miller, I would encourage, you said you, um, in f you were in favor of some of the proposals that you've heard from the community. I would encourage you to please communicate those to the PRC so as we move through this process, they're considered as, as we move forward. And, and of course, when you submit them, please submit them to um, Ms. Decker as well okay. um, so that she can in turn forward them to um, Margaret Ann and Michelle as appropriate. I will do that. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Sure. I just want to say I'm going to stay abstain from um, the motion to move the policies forward. Okay. I think we've already. We already okay, we already. Yeah. But you can yeah. note that, please. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, Ms. I would just like to say one thing. We did discuss the different types of, re of recommendations um, that would be additional recommendations separate from the policy, but also to point out that our next policy review committee meeting is June 20th. We're going to do that. Oh, excuse me. So any community members or um, anyone that wants to give us suggestions, you can email um, our chair, Ms. Romaine Williams, and copy our um, board secretary on it um, and get those to us and we'll just be able to discuss them. And I do have additional PRC updates, but it will be addressed during the um, committee Maybe. update report and that's when I was going to tell you when our next meeting is. But. Okay. Thank you. The Thank more you, you hear it, the better. All right. All right. Our um, next agenda item is uh, new business, revised school calendar for 2016 and 2017. For that, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Mayo and Mr. Duke to come forward. Good evening again. Good evening, Dr. Mayo. Um, as Dr. Dance indicated in um, his superintendent's report, um, we are back before you with the 16-17 school year's calendar um, after discussion through PRC um, and also um, after looking at the State Department's website and the change in the testing calendar. Um, so we have some changes to the um, calendar that has already been approved. Um, and the only changes would be on September 12th with, the, with that date becoming a professional development day. Uh, for um, for teachers and a student holiday um, 
for the Eid holiday um, that is now going to be honored on the 12th versus on September 11th. So with that, it also made a change to the end of the first marking period. Um, everything else as far as with option one that you have before you is actually the same as the calendar that's already been approved. Um, with the uh, options, MSD was um, very adamant about us keeping the start and end date um, as already planned. Um, so we had to work within those constraints uh, when we were put the, putting together the options or the revisions to our current plan, um, calendar has already been approved. For option two, um, we have built in a contingency in the event of the um, proposed heat policy, um, wherein we will um, use as contingencies two of the days that are currently serving as spring break, which would be um, on April 10th and April 11th as student school days. Um, and then spring break will start at the end of April 11th, so it'll be April 12th through um, April 17th would be the proposed spring break time period. So with option two, we will be building in a contingency um, if by March 1st of that school year, we've used up four of our inclement weather days, then those two days would then become, will, would become student days instead of um, spring break, or part of spring break, I should say. All right, thank you, Dr. Mayo. Uh, wait, just, 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 we're gonna have a plenty of time for this. But did you have a, I have a question just on that very point. Okay. I don't, I don't understand what you're saying. Okay, so in option two, in the event, let's say before March 1st, we've used up four inclement weather days. Well, let's say it. we used up 10. Well, then we would not have those two days built into our calendar for us for spring break. So on we one, would, that would, Monday the 10th and, and the 11th, would we cancel Excuse spring break? No, <laughs> just two days. Instead of having six days off of spring break, we'd only have four days. So we're going to have spring break anyway? Yes. Not Super Inten well, the superintendent said something earlier about the, the new uh, state superintendent saying we can utilize spring break or something. Maybe I just wasn't paying close attention. I just don't. And, and I'm asking this because, you know, let's suppose we have a really hot fall and we close schools for five or six days. So we're already using up most of our inclement weather days. And then, you know, we let's just say we have six or seven days that we owe. Are we going to cancel all of spring break? That's what I understood the superintendent to imply in his comment. I could be hearing him incorrectly. That's what I was wondering. George, you can go first and I'll tag team after you. Uh, option two basically has a contingency that if we were to use four days for inclement weather I by March that. 1st, Spring break would be delayed by two days. I heard what that, that also George. does for us is it gives us the opportunity to apply to the state for a waiver because we would have made the modification to our calendar that the state requires. That's been a problem in the past. So it serves two purposes. It serves the purpose of recouping two days as well as giving us the opportunity to apply for a waiver of the 180 student days. Okay, uh, that, that's that, that's fine. Except uh, um, we just have to show some modification to the state, I guess. Correct. Okay, so that's yes. good. Well, All thanks. Right. That helps. That helps a little bit. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I know we'll have some more discussion. I was going to ask at this time for a motion just to get it on the floor of either option one or option two, and then we could uh, discuss uh, where we are. Uh, if we if we understand option one and option two, is there a motion to um, adopt the calendar as presented under option one? Option two. I would say that we want to look to the to the which one is more flexible. Option two subsumes option one, right? It includes option one. Yeah, I think uh, the um, we want right. Well, we need the most flexibility. Yeah, that's true. Winter to worry about as well as heat. That's option two. one just addresses the holi uh, Muslim holidays. Right, and option two includes that. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Correct? Both yes. of these calendars are identical with the exception of option two. You have that contingency clause well, built into your calendar. Okay. So we're for two. Right. So, and I think to follow up on Mr. Duke and then the senator's conversation, if there were seven snow days, we would lose two spring break days, but then we would be in good standing with the state to be able to seek waiver of the other days. That is correct. correct. It does not, however, take away the, the, the ability of the superintendent to make a determination because we've used an excessive number of snow days to take whatever action he sees fit with um, consult of the board 
um, to go ahead and make any type of other alterations that may be required. Good. But, okay. So I, I move two. two. So two doesn't necessarily take away spring break. No, just so I'm clear, and the public's clear. It, it, it just oh, delays it, the start of spring break by two days. Right. Okay. No, I think he, he's saying it does reduce no. it two days. I don't, I don't think option two mandates a no, reduction no, in spring no, break. Right, it's based on the number of days oh, that okay. are actually right. used yeah. for either inclement what's or the, heat. What's the deadline, Dr. Mayo, it's a kabuki dates before that triggers in? Is it March 1st? Yes. So I think we need to go into this vote knowing you would use those dates by then. Yeah. If you look at traditionally our pattern, over the last five years, spring break will be four days for 16, 17, and not six. Mm -hmm. I don't want anyone going into it assuming that if or not, you know, if we don't get it, then we won't have to you know, do spring break. Traditionally, over the last five years, if you look at the weather patterns, we would have used that by March 1st. That is correct. All right. Is, is that because you think there will be heat days or more snow days? <laughs> well, if I could guess that, I would not be working here. <laughs> um, but he said just but based I, on I mean, just look at it, like, so over the last five more years, more our number days. of days we've missed for snow alone. Um, if you look at the August heat patterns that we have, then yes. Mr. Stewart, yes. So with those two days baked oh, in, that will give us sufficient grounds to ask for a waiver from the state? Correct. Do we have a sense of likelihood, or is it just 50-50? There are two conditions that the state requires in order for a, a jurisdiction to, to apply for and have a waiver approved in some form. And those two conditions are, one, that we use all of our inclement weather days, mm -hmm. and two, that we've made some modification to go ahead and recoup some student days in our calendar. Mm. Uh, in the past, we've been able, uh, for example, this past year, we did not use all of our inclement weather days. Had we used all of our inclement weather days, we still would not have qualified for the waiver. I understand. So I, I would just encourage my fellow board members to consider the idea that, you know, we are all in this together. There are 34 schools without air conditioning that we as a system decide collectively that will afford relief on those very hot days to all of us, even if we do have air conditioning for those that don't. Uh, I think that's that's the right call. So is that option two? Yes. Uh, Ms. Quasi? So we did discuss this a great deal at Policy Review Committee, and I appreciate the work um, that you <coughs> led and with the calendar committee that also worked around all of these options. Um, as a parent with children in the school system, it is a possible um, problem to make plans for that spring break, uh, Easter break, um, and then have to change them. But as Mr. Stewart pointed out, we are all in this together and we do have the serious issues of the schools um, that we wanna be able to close if it is too hot and still not be running school into the end of June. Um, so although uh, on, a, on a pure scheduling note, it could be problematic, I think by uh, properly communicating ahead of time to folks that you know this is the possibility and there is some probability to losing those first two days of spring break that people can plan accordingly um, that that would be good and I would also like you to speak to um, the fact that other jurisdictions do similar things related around weather and losing spring break that we are not that we will not be the pioneers in this. No, we are not the pioneers. Um, our um, neighboring jurisdiction, Hartford County, um, puts a contingency clause into their calendar, and they take they have a little bit of a different approach. They take days away, depending on how many days are being used. But spring break is definitely one of the the uh, things that are up on, that that is on the table as far as uh, attempting to recoup student days if the weather um, is is severe. Uh, yes, Ms. Williams. And thank you. Um, so if option two were um, to be approved by the board, what mechanism would be used by um, the school system to communicate that to the, to the public and to parents and well, students? Well, if the board were to approve option two, obviously the calendar would be posted. The current calendar would be taken down from the website. The new calendar would be posted. It carries... Um, it carries a caveat in the calendar itself 
Also, I would uh, uh, think that uh, coordination with the communications office and we would be able to put out the communication to all parents uh, and community uh, members um, that the new calendar has been approved and what the differences of that calendar are so that everyone would be forewarned that um, there's a, a new approach being taken by the jurisdiction uh, relative to inclement weather days and to spring break. I would strongly recommend that personally. I just think that's the right thing to do. We understand that communications is going to be very important, especially since this is a very, um, it's a new departure from what we've done in the past. Okay. Uh, Mr. Yolfala? I, I might suggest that if we adopt the heat policy and take a look at the, uh, what has happened to us during the winter over the past five or six years, use that as a model to see how this too would have affected the past several years. It, in addition, as a part of the notification to parents. So you can then determine the likelihood of whether, um, you know, we, we, you, can, you, you can say that we're going to be 80% chance that we're going to lose two days. Everyone can make their own determination, but if you could apply it, that to the past history of snow and heat, Let's see what we come up with. You may come up with something that's a 90% chance that we're going to lose two days. And, you know, if I were making plans for my kids for spring break, 90% uh, would uh, sort of dictate the way I was going to go. Just using some numbers. Mm. <laughs> All right. Um, that's your, that's your I would say that it, following up on Mr. Yulfutter, looking forward, though, and following up on Mr. Stort's comment, if we get past 2018-19 and all the schools are air conditioned, we have now also set a policy where we're going to be able to only deal with snow events. That's and true. And we're still going to have our spring break at risk going forward. That's right. So, yes. So this would be a one-year thing the board would be looking at. Because if we have less than 10 schools air conditioned for the start of the 17-18 school year, I can ask for an individual waiver for those 10 schools, and we can close just those 10 schools. So what you're saying is that a truncated spring break would only be in effect for this coming year, and that the years after look different. Yes. So this is a one-year sacrifice that I think well, we can do we for our 34 schools snow. that have no air conditioning. Yeah. Well, one thing to keep in mind, um, and, and Mr. Duke's exactly right, we apply to the state for waivers. You're not always necessarily guaranteed the waivers. We have days built into the calendar. The state can still say, use your days built into the calendar. So the state has come back to us saying they don't approve the waiver because we've not made any adjustments because once it's advertised, I don't like to go back and change in our community. But the state could still say for next school year, make your days up, and then we'll talk later. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Eaton. Have we ever taken away uh, Martin Luther King Day or President's Day to make up for snow day or heat days? Not since I have been here. I'm looking at no, we have, we have not. You can ask for state waivers. You can, oh, you, can, you can apply for a state waiver um, for certain holidays. Um, President's Day, not, not MLK Day. President's Martin Day Luther knows. King, uh, the state discourages Martin Luther King, but President's Day is one that can be looked at. And the Monday uh, after Easter. Yeah. And the Monday Easter after Easter, Easter as well. So again, I would ask if we could have a, a motion. We can still discuss, but do we have a motion for either option at this point? I think Senator Collins made a motion Ooh. a while ago. Yeah, uh, can you? Second. Okay. <laughs> All right, we have an, uh, uh, a motion for the adoption of option two. It's been seconded. Are there, is there, are there any other questions or comments at this time, Ms. Gauzy? Um, again, something that came to mind that we did discuss in policy review committee, but the rest of the board members in the community are not aware of. If you could just take a moment and talk about the calendar committee and who's on that in terms of having representatives from the teachers and so forth so that that this um, these options were brought forward after a great deal of um, investigation and input. The uh, calendar committee is made up of uh, representatives from each of the collective bargaining units. Uh, it has representation of, of teachers. Uh, it has representation of principals, uh, community members, um, the regional community um, bodies, uh, representatives. Um, various offices, uh, including facilities, transportation, um, also uh, have representation on the committee. Uh, the committee uh, took into consideration all of the PRC's recommendations, um, and uh, there was a great deal of discussion 
relative to spring break. Um, your concerns were, were uh, discussed um, and basically these were the, um, the results of those discussions as well as consultation with the superintendent. All right. And I really want to thank you for listening to PRC and taking into account our observations. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, if there are no other questions at this time, I'll ask for a vote on adopting a uh, calendar as presented as item uh, option two. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any, oh, it's unanimous. Then uh, the option two um, uh, motion carries. And again, I think, Mr. Duke, what you heard uh, is that we can't over-communicate, I guess, uh, as a system here. And uh, as Dr. Dan said, if there's a high probability that we feel that we're going to lose those, I think the more that parents and families understand that, the less heartache that we will incur. So, uh, But again, we appreciate the uh, presentation, and thank you for your information. Thank you. All right. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir, Mr. Collins. Um, I know we have item P before we get to Q. Um, <laughs> however, um, I think we should, uh, I think we should uh, defer the report on Blueprint 2.0 for another time. So this moved. This meeting is virtually endless as it is, and uh, Mr. Virch wants to get home because it's his wife's birthday. And um, <laughs> I believe we have several other things, including committee updates and comments. Added. And, and I think we should, uh, I, I think in lengthy meetings like this, we don't need to have uh, reports uh, with all due respect to Dr. Brown and the folks that worked on it. I think we should defer that to the next meeting. Well, again, that would uh, constitute an agenda change. So, well, um, so what? Then change so then the we, we, if you have the votes. We, we will, that's right. We'll, we, we have a motion that's been seconded, seconded to uh, postpone item Q. Um, I would ask uh, if there's any further discussion. Uh, otherwise, all those in favor. I'd, like okay. I'd, I'd like to know whether there are any repercussions uh, sure. if we do yeah. postpone this to a later yeah. meeting. To a report? It's okay. a report, David. I just want to make okay. sure, okay. you know, uh, whatever you want. there's no time associated with it. That's all. I have a comment. We've approved the agenda at the beginning of the meeting. And I don't, we're not really, because we had that discussion at the parliamentary procedures um, with the mate. I don't, I don't, we're not allowed to change the agenda at, at that point. We have to change it in the beginning of the meeting. Yeah. Well, I'll ask our parliamentarian over there, is that, are we doing something out of uh, Robert's rules if we, we, we do whatever we want to do? I think that you can certainly pass them. And we're looking, I'm, I'm wanted to check one thing on the, on the board policy. But I think that you could certainly move to postpone that right. agenda item until, until the next meeting. Sure. Or okay. table. Or table it. I'm, I would move to modify my motion to table. Yeah, we can table it. Okay. So, all, right. Yeah. Yeah. all right. I do need a second on that. Second. All right. All those in favor of tabling the meeting, please say aye. That was a Freudian <laughs> slip, I think. Uh, <laughs> tabling. Uh, my spouse, I, thank you. <laughs> item Q. I'm sorry. Tabling item Q until our next meeting, please say aye. Uh, Aye. Any opposed? Hi there. So it is. We're <laughs> <laughs> going down. Yeah. My phone is uh, Mr. turned Mr. Newfelder's off. Mr. Newfelder's phone is yeah. opposed. <laughs> but but, but uh, Mr. Chairman, we, we do want to thank um, Dr. Brown and the others for coming tonight in preparation yeah. for that. So thank you for your thank time. You, thank you very and, much. Yeah, and, and, and all staff. of the staff. Yeah. Thank you so much. Dr. Yeah. Brown, can you and your staff, Dr. Brown, can you and your staff please stand up so we can personally thank you for a great report? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Go. There you go. Thank you. I wanted you to know we acknowledge you. Yeah, thank you very much for your, your time. Um, just to keep things moving again, our next item is uh, item P, and I'll call for it Ms. Johnson and Ms. White. Uh, these are co consideration of the 2016-17 course additions and deletions. Okay, thank you. As the chair of the Board of Education's Curriculum Committee and in accordance with the Board's Policy 600, Curriculum Committee presents the following course additions and deletions for your approval. Course additions and deletions are determined based upon student achievement needs and interests, alignment to current standards and scheduling for specialized programs. All proposed additions and deletions have been vetted in accordance with the board policy. Um, I am going to read the um, course area and then the full list will be in the minutes. 
So the following are course additions, uh, college and career readiness additions, career and technology education, ESOL to ad uh, additions to ESOL, music and dance education, social studies, visual arts, and world languages. And the following are course deletions. We have some deletions in ESOL, science, social studies, visual arts, and world languages. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. At this time, I'm going to ask for a motion to approve Exhibit P1. Moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay, it's moved and second. Is there any discussion at this time? Ms. Causey. I can't pull it up on my board docs right now, but I did read it all earlier, and it did appear um, that some of it is alignment. When you're deleting one course, it's it's uh, being replaced by another course. Um, the one thing that, so much of that made a great deal of sense to me. <clears throat> uh, what I don't understand is with the Spanish program that's moving forward, and I believe it's Spanish 6, 7, and 8 are the new courses. How does that align with what has historically been Spanish 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 going on to the advanced placement courses? At what point do they overlap? And, and then a student can be on track to take the advanced placement level of those courses. Kazi, are you speaking of the ESOL courses? No, it no, was she's just talking the about middle school courses middle, that we're yes. creating. Yes. And how does that correspond with the high school ones, which the board approves? Yes. Right. They, it's all in alignment. Again, those. This, can you ask me your question again? <laughs> Just so that I make sure I understand your question. Yes, and I apologize. Board docs is not up, and I, I don't always print out everything. Um, but there's Spanish six, seven, and eight. Yes. Yes. So how does that align with what has traditionally been Spanish one, two, three, four? Yes, five, which is advanced placement, absolutely. and then six, which is also advanced placement. Question. Yes, we're trying to make sure that students have the flexibility to move within um, Spanish 6, 7, and 8 to have that type of uh, differentiated instruction in those Spanish courses. And so then uh, there's a difference in how we're moving forward so that a student in um, Spanish 1 that would typically have occurred in seventh grade isn't necessarily stuck there if they need to advance further. So this um, block of Spanish courses um, with that block of six, seven, and eight would allow that type of flexibility. So then is there an evaluation at the end of eighth grade to determine where they go in high school to start to line up? Your evaluations for all of our courses. I'm sorry? We have end of, end of the year evaluations for our courses. Okay, so then at, so would it be the final evaluation at eighth grade, which would determine their ninth grade yes. tying into the yes. traditional cl classes? Yes. Okay, thanks. All right. Uh, Ms. Walia. A uh, question about a particular course. So for uh, biology GT magnet, I mean, I, just from per uh, personal experience, I've seen a lot of popularity in that pro program, so I'm just asking why we're deleting that. Yeah, it's just there's very little difference between the magnet, the GT magnet and GT. Uh, so okay. there's biology GT and then there's bio biology GT magnet and so there was very little difference uh, okay. in the two. So those courses still exist, but okay. just as biology GT. I got you. Thank you. All right. If there are no further questions, we've had a motion. It's been seconded. I would ask all those in favor of approving Exhibit P1 to please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. White. All right. Um, our next agenda item will be item P, and that's a proposed audit of uh, the Board of Education, and for that I'll turn it over to Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That is actually R. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, item R. And I, I handed out a copy of my motion earlier today. I move that the Board hires an outside independent auditor to conduct a performance audit or other appropriate advisory engagement of the operations of the Board of Education of Baltimore County with the objective of, of providing recommendations for operational improvements and ensuring compliance with board requirements. Items which shall be audited include but are not limited to structure and functionality of board meetings, board committee operations, budget process, communications and information requests, meeting minutes and transparency, board employee evaluations, board governing documents, and board policies. Thank you, Ms. Miller. There's uh, been a motion. Is there a second? Second. All right. Uh, 
Is there any discussion at this time? Thank you. I'd like to speak to my motion. Um, we've had a lot of conversations over the time that I've been on the board over the last six months. Um, a lot of issues have been raised about our processes and operations. Um, and I believe that we have a dire need for a review of our operations for functional improvement. Um, there's also a number of requirements uh, that are placed on the board and those who report directly to the board, which we need to ensure we are in compliance and that we are requiring compliance. So some examples would be issues such as board policies which don't serve the interests of the board but hog tie the board or hand authority from the board to the superintendent or concentrate power in the hands of board leadership rather than the full board. Uh, we talked earlier today, it was mentioned about how buildings and contracts committee meets two hours before our board meetings. Mm -hmm. When we vote on numerous multi-million dollar contracts, today it totaled about $200 million. With no time to gather additional information pursuant to those committee discussions. We have an ineffective budget process which doesn't allow for an adequate understanding of the budget by board members or the public, limits public input, and results in budgets which do not reflect the priorities of the board. And that was also mentioned uh, when we took our break before the open session and met with the advisory councils. That was mentioned by one of the uh, chairs of the advisory councils. Um, the board has no <coughs> written effective process for board members to receive information they request from the central office, just conflicting language in the board handbook. Information has not been communicated well from committees to the full board and the public. Our committees are gerrymandered and inequitable. Uh, we have not conducted uh, <coughs> evaluations of board direct reports nor a self-evaluation of the board is required. Uh, now I'm glad to see that we are beginning to address that issue but we had missed at least one evaluation on that. Um, the board has no charter or bylaws as government governing documents, only policies and a handbook so that would be something that could be considered the board has no system in place to ensure that the superintendent is complying with the requirements of his employment contract. The board selectively enforces Robert's rules and is inconsistent on its unwritten practices. <coughs> so there's, these are just some of the issues. I could go on with others. Um, all of these have been brought up but to date remain unresolved. Uh, I think that they could be easily resolved. Um, and because the board has failed to address these issues, it indicates to me that we really need an independent outside entity to come in and take a look at our operations and help us address these issues. I believe that a prime reason for some of the discord we have had on the board is because of operational dysfunction. Um, I want to clarify here um, the difference here of, of what we're trying to achieve. There is process and then there is actual uh, topics or, or requests. So for example, there have been issues with getting information as an example. Um, I'm not asking for the board to approve any specific requests. What we need to do, though, is approve a process for going about making requests. So regardless of who is using that process, we have correct processes in place. And that's just an example. Thank you, uh, Ms. Miller. I just uh, will point out that this um, proposal was brought up into the audit committee and was not supported. I don't know if Mr. Yofelder would want to make some comments about. Yeah, I, I would like to tell the board, number one, that this uh, proposal is absolutely out of order. 
every item that's been presented in this motion uh, is <laughs> under the governance of this board. As our attorney has told us in many cases, as long as we are in compliance with Comar and the uh, State Board of Education, we can decide whatever process that we want to do. Uh, we can decide and have decided because each one of these now has uh, some reference in either policy and or our handbook. If we want to change policy, we have a system for reviewing every policy uh, periodically and it, based on the recommendations of the policy review committee, we can change a policy relative to any one of these. Let me tell you what an auditor does. Number one, an auditor reviews or examines and to see what they're doing is in compliance with either principles, standards, processes, or laws or regulations. And an auditor, when doing that, if they find uh, some area uh, that requires uh, a, a change or requires the fact that the board did not follow its processes, then they call that a finding and point it out. Um, there is nothing here uh, where I have ever heard of any standards for a budget process. Every organization develops their own budget process that suits their needs and purposes. If you want to change the budget process, then we change our budget process. We have the right to do that. We don't have anybody who can come in and tell us that our budget process is wrong or we're not adhering to our policy. We rely on council to tell us when we, have, when we are deviating from Comar or any other regulations. And then there's another side of it if you're going to try and engage an outside auditor. Number one, you can't tell an auditor limited to. To what? We would have to put out an RFP. We'd have to say exactly what we want. We'd have to review RFPs. And we'd have to get a cost. And I don't know, have any idea of what the cost would be. But it's not necessary. If there's anything wrong with any of these items that you referenced, then it's up to the board to discuss it and change it. That's why we have administrative function. These basically are all administrative functions. Board policies, we have a review process. Board governing documents, right. COMAR, and the State Board of Education. Board employee evaluations, what, what employees? The only employee we really have is the superintendent, and we do an evaluation for the superintendent. The board meet, excuse me. Board meetings yeah, and transparency, we decide on the board minutes. We've suggested that our board, our board be videoed, and this is our official minutes. If you want to change the way we do our minutes, then you bring a motion up to change the, the minutes. What I'm trying to say is that there's no auditor who can tell us what to do in any of these items. We're the ones that decide what we want to do. If we want change, then we go about making change. Um, board committee operations, we have in, in our policies the board committees and how they operate. If you want to change them, let's change them. What, what I'm saying, this, is, this would be a complete waste of time in trying to engage an outside auditor to review what we're doing and compare them to either the principles or processes uh, because we're the ones that created the principles and the processes. Uh, I, I would urge us not, not even to consider this. Thank you. Any other qu question, Ms. Causey? Well, I would just like to say that uh, I agree with Ms. Miller that there are a number of, of issues with how the board operates um, internally. And, you know, not to disclose something that happened in a closed session, but there were issues that were brought up there about functioning of the board. So um, that in the next administration, administrative function I can remind us about. Um, so that there, in my opinion, there is a need for evaluation of, of these issues. And even CPAs that are certified to prepare financial documents have independent auditors audit their work. Um, in the audit committee when I was on it for a few months, we went over that. 
We have internal financial people and they have external auditors come in and audit their financial documents and so forth, and they do. If they find something uh, that's not up to standard or process or uh, gap, generally accepted accounting principles, then they'll make a finding, they'll make a note of it, and it's an opportunity for the organization to improve. Um, and I would like to suggest that as we do our committee work, as we visit schools and are involved in so many um, activities with the school system, that it would be helpful to have an outside person that takes a comprehensive look rather than all of us trying to evaluate everything. Um, and so it happens all the time with auditors in all kinds of ways. And if uh, the county had given us our uh, extra internal audited person to help our um, internal audit staff, that's maybe something that they could do. But as it is, they um, are overworked. We did not get that budget item approved. Um, so this is a way to do through one contract, one thing that would need to get done. And I just think that, uh, that it would be helpful for us to do. Mr. Birch. Mr. Chairman, thank you for giving me this opportunity to briefly speak. I know my spouse awaits. <laughs> First, for, one, for folks to argue that we should look internally for leadership for our own central office, and to later argue that we should look externally to audit how we operate, to me is an inherent contradiction. Secondly, to suggest that these problems are readily resolvable and easily fixed, then tells me that the needless expense and time and energy that would be spent on this concept, it would be a waste. Thirdly, as I audit, the recent actions of the Maryland General Assembly. I note that they have made a majority of this board an elected board. Unlike some who will be appointed by the governor for a five year, who have been appointed by the governor for a five year term, the auditors in this county are the parents, the voters. They're the ones who will be auditing how this board does its job to serve our citizens. I have said this once before. Well, I welcome new ideas. I think this is a solution, proposed solution, in search of a problem that the General Assembly, which not only created this board and also created the superintendent's administrative function, but has now turned this board into a hybrid board. This matter's been addressed. It's being reviewed as this is being live streamed. It's being audited in real time, not for some outside expert to come to our county and tell our voters who are perfectly capable of making their own decisions whether this school system is headed in the right direction or not. Those are my final comments. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stewart? I would call the vote. All right. I'd like to respond right. to some of the comments. Well, the votes we have have been called. Called. Do it, is there a second to call second. the vote? Second. All right. Um, all those in, oh, is there any, dis, uh, all those in favor of calling the vote, please raise your hand. Okay, we have a two thirds majority. So um, I'm going to call the question. Uh, all those in favor of the motion proposed by Ms. Miller, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Okay, so that uh, motion does not carry. Thank you. We'll move to our next agenda item. Um, our next agenda item is uh, committee updates. I don't know if uh, at this time, uh, Ms. Williams, I know I'll start with you. You had some. Yes, I do. Thank you so much, um, Chairman McDaniels. The Policy Review Committee um, met on last on Monday, May 16th. And um, as a result, we presented some highlights of the heat policy um, to you tonight. Um, but also we want to bring to your attention that the committee uh, has reconsidered its recommendation concerning the Muslim High Holy, da High Holy Days and will be presenting a formal recommendation for action at the upcoming board retreat. Uh, we want the board to be aware that the committee uh, is, has been recommending that the Muslim High Holy uh, Days, the two Eids, uh, be included as holidays on future school calendars. Um, that will be something that the board will be asked to vote on. Um, 
but I'm bringing it to everyone's attention tonight because that is something that came out of PRC, and um, I don't want anyone to say that they didn't know what's going to happen, um, that the vote was going to be called for during our retreat. And then lastly, I do want to remind everyone that um, PRC meets again next on Monday, June 20th at 5.30 p.m. in this room. So anyone who would like to come, you are welcome. I actually want to thank members of the public who have taken the time to come. Actually, several of them have come up to me afterwards, and they have thanked me um, for how PRC operates, and they see firsthand the hard work that PRC does, and I think they better understand the process as a result. Um, so thank you to the public. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Mr. Yofel, do you have anything for tonight? Yes. Um, the uh, Audit Committee, Internal Audit Committee met and discussed and approved a strategic work plan for the year 2017. Um, I might tell you that the available hours uh, for the internal audit group is a little over 15,000 hours. And of those 15,000 hours, 12,000 hours are either required by uh, grants or other uh, audits that they have to do and or are follow-ups. And half of those hours are spent on investigations of allegations or other things that are brought through the hotline for fraud, waste, and abuse. So you can see that the internal audit group uh, is really engaged and extremely busy uh, with the work that they must do. Uh, they have very little flexibility. Um, and so the uh, Audit Committee approved their strategic work plan for 2017. In addition, there was a discussion of, of various um, risk items that come across the system that every entity has. And uh, these uh, will be discussed and uh, in some way, shape, or form uh, incorporated uh, into the next year's work plan. That was, that was, our, that was the conduct of our meeting. Thank you, Mr. Hillfeather. Anything further on contracts, Mr. Gillis? Well, I think that the, uh, the contracts committee has been discussed substantively today. <laughs> um, we continue to meet in advance of these meetings. We continue now to get our materials a uh, week and a half before these meetings. Um, and we continue to have the obligation to review uh, the many contracts that make this uh, great Baltimore County school board, I mean, school system machine run. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Uh, Ms. Johnson, anything from curriculum? Um, yep. Uh, we, the curriculum committee um, has the first look of many looks that the board has the opportunity to investigate a variety of curriculum data, information, and updates. Um, at our last meeting, you can see there was a variety of contracts that were brought forth to the board. Um, I can assure you that our committee um, has discussed, questioned, and reviewed, and unofficially approved the contracts that we discussed. I want to thank our fellow, my fellow board members, Vice Chair Chuck McDaniels, Ed Gillis, June Eaton, and Deke Chawalia. Um, Mr. Virch, while we might not always agree, I always respect you. So I implore you to watch the live playback or the live stream playback from the video today, and you tell me if you find your behavior was overly aggressive and condescending, because I can assure you as a fellow board member as the chair of the curriculum committee and the co-chair of PRC, I felt that it was. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, our, uh, you know what, I'm sorry. Lastly, our next meeting is Thursday, 6-16 um, at 4.30. And among other things, we're going to discuss dyslexia and recognizing the signs, treatment, and interventions. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Um, our next agenda item, I'll move on, is uh, public comment on policies, and we have two policies that will be commented on, uh, by, both by Dr. Ferrone. Uh, so I'll call him up, and uh, the policies are, let's see which one we start with, uh, community uh, involvement, policy 1270, and then that will be followed by uh, personnel policy uh, 4005. Good evening to all. Good evening. Good evening. I understand I'm standing between you and, <laughs> and closure of the meeting. 
uh, policy 1270. Am I correct, Mr. Yes. Chair? Yes, that's okay. correct, Dr. Well, 1270, apologize for my voice, uh, about family engagement. Uh, I think the wording is really great, engagement. I like the word engagement. Collaboration in, in the policy is great. And uh, of course, uh, what's mentioned about the personal success of all students, all are really good. However, um, in practice, how much really the school system is doing actually engagement with the community? Um, I'm not really critical of you as a chair. I don't want you to take it personally. But you know, today with shutting off the microphones, it really gave poor taste to the public. And you know, if somebody really takes extra 15 seconds, 30 seconds, it's not really big big deal, most of the time that it's really spent in the board is really with board members arguing the cases back and forth, back and forth. Of course, Ms. June Eaton is very quiet. If all board members are quiet like that, <laughs> we'll finish really early altogether. Um, another example about engagement is really myself. I have been engaged with the school system about equal holidays for 20 years, 12 of those years continuously. And, um, you know, I don't get really response for my emails. Uh, many of my questions, uh, although really in the past several months, are answered, but nonetheless, uh, it's not really that great. Um, I was asking for a printout of the agenda today, and I was told by Art that he's forbidden of printing agenda, so it's really not really easy to do even the little things. And I notice really in uh, our meetings, it's very hard to put an item on the agenda. This is really a part of engagement too. So the policy is great, and what I'm trying to say, when we use the word engagement, we mean positive engagement. We mean engagement that we apply it in reality and not really use it as a policy and only partially applying it. So I encourage you really as board members really to put that into effect. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Farron. So the next policy is 4,005 on personnel. The next policy is 4,005. And I really like the policy. However, I would like to descend on one, one item. I realize conflict of interest can be a problem. However, if a teacher has a rapport with the family and the student, student needs an extra two hours of math or two hours of science, that teacher to that student would be really the best match after school hours. And that really should not really be considered a conflict of interest. My thought about conflict of interest is the more we hide things, the worse it can be. The more it is out in the public, the better it is. So if everyone knows that teacher John is teaching student Michael after hours and being paid for it, it's really quite open and well known to everyone. Um, I don't see really the use about supplies any issue. Of course, you know, a teacher should not really use school supplies when tutoring a student. But um, I think a consideration of allowing a teacher to teach a student of his or her class, provided that it is open and well known to administration and to family. And thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Well, Pratt. I have more time. No, <laughs> just teasing. Thank you. All right. Um, our next agenda item is uh, board member comments. And I'll try to start with Mr. Stewart this time, and we'll move around. If it looks like he's ready. I have none. We have <laughs> Ms. Eaton? Yes. The reason that I don't have many questions is because I try to attend the buildings and contract meetings and listen to all the discussions, and many of my questions are answered then. So it's no sense of reiterating during the meeting. Um, I knew, know we uh, threw out item P, but I was hoping to add 
three more ag agenda items so we could complete the alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Miss Dean. <laughs> Miss William, is anything further? I have nothing further. I've spoken enough tonight. Miss Causey? I always have something to say because I'm still competing with Senator Collins. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is that uh, this is a, a close to the school year. As uh, the superintendent was pointing out, um, in a few short days, the schools will be closing and the teachers will be wrapping up. Um, and. It is a time to be grateful and a time to reflect. And I just wanted to say, number one, uh, I was really blessed to be able to attend six graduations. Um, I went to Lock Raven, Delaney, Hereford, Franklin, Newtown, and Patapsco High School. And I just have to say, it was so inspiring to meet even more teachers um, than I had already met this year and in my students' uh, educational life that just genuinely care about these students and they want to do whatever they can to help these students succeed. And of course the ones that we saw walk across the stage are the success story for the school system. And then the students were excited and they were supportive of each other and they were grateful to their parents and the teachers and the administrators in the school system. So it was just wonderful to, to wrap up this school year with that event. The excitement was contagious, and I have to say that Patapsco had the most incredibly decorated caps. Uh, so I, I, I was told I didn't see Carver's. You didn't see Carver's. But the, one, uh, the ones that I saw. So that was really fantastic. Um, and I do just want to quickly say that um, being on the board this year has been amazing. Um, and I've tried uh, very hard to uh, do a great job for the school system because I believe in public education and I believe in Baltimore County Public Schools. And I want it, us to improve and I want to uh, take care of the needs of the people. I feel uh, that I did learn a lot, uh, but there's still more to do. Um, I would also like to find a way to get more input from teachers. Um, so that's something that I'll be working on um, as I move forward in my work. And with that, I just want to say thank you to my fellow board members and the superintendent, and good night. And have a happy summer, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Ms. Yoffel? Well, my first question to Kathleen is how is your hand after six graduations? It's great. <laughs> and, and how much hand cleaner did you use? I used a whole bottle. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> Um, I, I just want to make one comment. You know, a lot of times we, uh, myself and others get criticized that we don't ask the, uh, too many questions or enough questions or more questions uh, of our administrative staff. And uh, some people view that as acquiescing to uh, those who are making the reports or giving us information. But the other side of it is recognizing that we have an amazing, intelligent, educated, smart group of people who support our superintendent. And in my opinion, they are the professionals. And I think that uh, we ought to take more credence. And I think our Senator Collins made a comment. I'm sorry everybody wasn't here during uh, contracts um, congratulating our staff. And I'm sorry it wasn't video because I want to play it back to you in the future. But I do agree with you that we've got an amazing group and uh, I am very supportive of them, and I know that they are the uh, support that makes the superintendent uh, or creates the decisions that he makes uh, and has them follow. We follow through with them, and they are good decisions, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yulfelder. Mr. Gillis, anything further? Uh, Mr. Yulfelder said it all, and thanks, Deacha. Thank you. I actually have one thing to say. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Thank you again for a fantastic year. I will miss all of you and forever cherish the relationships and the experiences I've gained this year. And just a reminder that we are aboard as a team of 13, and we need to keep our personal feelings for each other, our personal agendas, or whatever else, else aside, and work together as a team as we move forward. Our students and our school system is our priority, so let's focus on that, and I wish everyone a good, best of luck as they move forward. Thank you for a great year. Thank you, Ms. Waya. Mr. Collins. Just quickly, I want to wish my good friend Barbara Blake, uh, Steve Virch's wife, a happy birthday. <laughs> I want to tell you all that the Orioles beat the Red Sox 3-2. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Collins. Ms. Johnson. Stop being. I'm, I'm good. Thank you. I'm good. Ms. Miller. 
Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm a process person, and I have been a big advocate for um, trying to improve our processes here on the board in my six months. Uh, as a minority voice, an alternative voice on the board, I know that a lot of what I want to get past is not going to pass. So I look at the improvement of our process and, and operations as one of the things that I really can contribute or attempt to contribute. I think it's, uh, it'll take time. First, we need to acknowledge some of the areas that we need improvement in. Um, and I think, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouths, but I think Ms. Causey would agree with me that we have attempted various methods to improve some processes. We've jumped through a lot of hoops. And uh, what I was trying to do with the audit was to bring it outside and not have it be Ann Miller is saying we need improvements in processes, but an outside independent auditor who can look at us objectively and tell us where we need improvement and, and make recommendations for us. So it's another hoop that we've jumped through. I hope that at least in making that motion, we're bringing to light some of the areas that we need to improve. And as Mr. Virch said, we can do it ourselves. I agree with what, what Mr. Yulfelder said. It is something we can do ourselves. I said it also. It's something we can easily do, but we haven't. And that's why I brought that motion forward. So I hope that we'll take another look and another attempt at doing it ourselves, acknowledge where we need to improve, and be open maybe to something that maybe even Ann Miller might suggest. I also wanted to offer my congratulations to all of our new graduates this year. I, I had a lot of fun. It was very exciting to attend those graduations. Uh, especially the one for Hereford High, where my daughter graduated right. last a week or so ago. Um, I also attended one for my alma mater, Lock Raven High School. And all the students and teachers and administrators at Ruxton Ridge and Maiden Choice Schools were truly inspirational. And uh, congratulations to all. Thank you, Ms. Miller. And Mr. Chairman, to those uh, overly, Kenwood, uh, my alma mater, uh, Perry Hall, Parkville, Chesapeake, and Eastern Tech students, it was my pleasure to be there on the stage with our superintendent and with other board members um, to, see, to see these young people beginning their, to continuing really their lives on the road to learning. And I just happened to go across that stage because ours were over at um, the Towson Arena. Um, this is just the first step in their, in their uh, another step in their lifelong learning. Uh, I also participated in a career day at uh, my alma mater elementary school in Hawthorne. I want to thank Doris Barnes of our County Bar Association and Patty DeGuilme of our uh, Baltimore City Bar Association, uh, the, um, the admissions offices for the University of Baltimore School of Law and the University of Maryland School of Law. Uh, for their help with the career day and uh, Howard University offered uh, to help us next year because they were all going to a conference this year But they offered to help us uh, with the Hawthorne career day next year and of course um, Yvonne Barheit uh, Congratulations to her, but she did a tremendous job along with Amanda Diaz on making that a success Full career day at Hawthorne to my good friend Marisol Johnson I extended an offer of my help and support in any way I can to assist with uh, what uh, she feels may be necessary over at Franklin Middle School. And just as uh, you know, there may be something there that uh, needs to be corrected, uh, hopefully um, we will now have clarified for parents just what it means when uh, curriculum uh, is looked at or reviewed by our curriculum committee. Thank you all so much, and it's, it's time to get out of here. Thank you, Mr. Birch. Um, to close out, our last agenda item is just some information uh, that's included in the distribution for this evening. A report on the Education Foundation of Baltimore County and a financial report for the months ending April 2015 and 2016. Uh, just some announcements for uh, the evening. Um, 
Thursday, June 16th, elementary and middle schools dismissed three hours early. High schools in session are all day. Friday, June 17th, elementary and middle schools dismissed three hours early. Same thing, high schools in session all day. Schools and offices are closed on Monday, July 4th. And our next meeting is Tuesday, July 12th at 7 p.m. here at Greenwood. Thanks for hanging in there with us. Our meeting's now adjourned.